Okay, we'll get going. So what I'm going to try and do today, you have the pleasure of me all day, is I'm going to talk about two main things. It'll be a little bit different to a lot of the sort of Unix-based stuff that other guys have been teaching you. I'm going to kind of teach you the, the cheap way of doing genomic analysis if you don't know how to code, which some people may be going, yes, that's exactly what I need, and some else, others of you may be going, well, I know how to code, so why is that? Why does that matter? Even if you do know how to code and a, a, a whiz with all that stuff, I think there'll be a lot of useful things in here that you can still learn. Um, I work with bioinformaticians who've been doing stuff for like 30 years and they still learn things from some of the tools that are in here. They're like, wow, that's so cool. I wish I knew how to do that 10 years ago. So yeah, so the two main topics are, we're gonna talk about the UCSC genome browser. Um, we'll see how time goes. I wanna try and break around 12-ish. One of my postdocs is uh, leaving the lab in a couple of days, so we're going out for lunch. So one of the luxuries of running this session is I can control the timing. So we'll try and break around 12, we'll probably take about an hour and a half lunch break and hopefully come back around 1.30, but we'll play that by ear as things go along. So what I wanted to try and get done in the morning was maybe these two things, though that might be pushing it. So we'll start off with like an, an introduction of all the basic features of the UCSC genome browser, then go into some, some of the more advanced functions, things like the table browser, custom tracks, and things that you can do with that. And then this afternoon, what we'll talk about is another web-based tool called the Galaxy Toolkit, which is fully integrated with the UCSC Genome Browser, and that really enables you to do lots of good bioinformatic functions simply with a, the sort of point and click of a mouse. These are the two websites. I would get both of these up, mark them as your favorites. I would say I visit the UCSC Genome Browser pretty much every day of my career for the last 15 years. It's my favorite hub site for doing anything in genetics, as I will hopefully show you. And then my aim by the end of today, this is where we're gonna finish off this afternoon, is you guys are hopefully gonna be able to solve these different challenges. They're just random things I thought up last night at about one in the morning for you guys to solve. So take a read through of those because as we kind of go through the day, bear in mind you're gonna be trying to solve these questions later on. So I'll be showing you different functionalities in the UCSC Genome Browser, how to get data, how to sort it, how to filter it, and then some of the tools are available in the Galaxy Toolkit. As its name suggests, it's exactly that's a toolkit. It doesn't contain any data. It's just a bunch of commands, things you can execute on data to do stuff to it. And yeah, and then we'll, we'll put you guys in groups and we'll have a little race of which group can solve these different questions the fastest and then present to the group of how they did it. Another good thing to bear in mind, there's usually 10 different ways to solve most problems like this. So I may have a way in my head that I would do it, I'll sometimes work with other people and they're like, oh no, I did it this way or that way. It's like, oh yeah, that's cool, or that's better, or that's slower, or, or that's good, but it has this disadvantage or something. So, <coughs> as I maybe mentioned before, a lot of things in bioinformatics, there are just choices. There's often no you know, cookbook of how you do things. It's like, this is the data I have, this is the problem I wanna solve, this is the point I wanna get to, and there can be multiple ways to get to that end point, um, some of which are better than others but as long as you know what each function, each command is doing, um, and understand the strengths or limitations of that, then I'd say you're doing fine. Okay, um, so today we have, right now, just one TA, if you wanna stand up quickly. This is Felix, he's a MD, PhD student. Um, I'm on your committee, so. <laughs> so you sort of specialize in whole genome sequence analysis and integrating that with sort of epigenetic functional data. Yeah, um, yeah and RNA-seq, so. Um, there should be one other person coming along, Mafalda, who's a, she defended her thesis on Monday. She's a PhD student in my lab for another few weeks at least until she officially graduates. Um, and as we kind of go through the sessions, there'll be lots of points where I'll be showing you stuff. I think the way it's gonna work best if everyone has these websites up and not only are you following along the slides, but I'll try and go slow. I would say the best way you guys are gonna learn is doing these things, having the UCSC Genome Browser, the Galaxy Toolkit open and actually executing some of these commands and you know, navigating your way around the website and figuring things out. And I guarantee at points people will get lost, people will get stuck, people will have questions, thoughts, um, and I think it's gonna work best if people just kind of pipe up, stick your hand up and say, oh, how do I do this? Or what about that? Or I'm stuck and 
we can just pause and Felix and the Fowler can hopefully help you and me as well. So just to start off, how many people here have used the UCSC Genome Browser before? Okay, so most people. And of those, who would say they're sort of like a basic user? Anybody would say they're like a more advanced user, they're really more familiar with it? Okay, all right. So most of you feel like you're basic users. And uh, again, even though I've been using this since like 2000, when even before the, the human genome was released, it was first put up on the UCSC genome browser and it was really choppy in those days. And I still learn stuff. I'll be leaning over someone's shoulder and like, oh, how did you do that? And they show me some little tool. So they're always updating the UCSC genome browser, adding in new features. So even if you've used it for a long time, again, you'll still probably learn things that you didn't know before. And like I say, at any point anyone's like, falls behind, just stick up your hand, even if you don't want to interrupt things. I can go and send Felix to help you out. Or if people next to you, if you're really good and the person next to you is struggling, help each other out, it'll work much better. What we're going to do is start off by just going over the, the very basic features of the UCSC Genome Browser, how it works, how you kind of set up your different preferences and how it displays things to you, how you move around and navigate in amongst it and, and the different buttons and things that do how you can do searches, change the display, look at sequence within it, because everything I'm going to show you is basically looking at the human genome, which fundamentally is a string of A's, T's, C's, and G's. But as you'll see, it's displaying that in a, a format that's much more useful than just that. show you how to do things like sequence searches. So probably a lot of you ha have heard of BLAST. That was around a long time. UCSC Genome Browser has a, a feature within it called BLAT, which is BLAST-like, much, much faster, and it's a really nice way of just quickly finding things in the, in the genome. And then we're going to do some exercises just to get you guys using things and, and falling over and stumbling and hopefully we'll help you back on your feet. So yeah, if everyone wants to start by just getting the UCSC Genome Browser up, and like I say, as we go through, try and follow through some of these things, I would say, as I explained to you uh, previously, everything in the human genome is based on a coordinate system. So the reference human genome is the sequence of a few different people's alleles stuffed together. And every single base that's in that genome has a chromosome that it's assigned to, and then a, a number. So from the top of each chromosome, base number one, down to the end of the chromosome, at the bottom of the long arm, base number n. And then there are a ton of other annotations that onto that string of A's, T's, C's, and G's that have been added. So basically things like chromosome bands, what you look at down the microscope, roughly where those dark and light bands that you see at G-banding are, where gaps are in the human genome, bits that we don't fully know what they are, where known and predicted genes are, then there's annotations of genes or features that are associated with different diseases, <coughs> epigenetic data, data from uh, arrays and RNA sequencing about how highly genes are expressed in different tissues, variations, repeats, lots of other stuff. And all these things, the easiest way to access them is all through the UCSC Genome Browser. So this is a, a shot of a region of chromosome 17 at the top here. We're looking at the P53 gene, it's a very famous tumor suppressor. And just to kind of walk you through, if you're looking at something in the UCSC Genome Browser, we have at the top the coordinates, so where you are on the chromosome. This is the base pair coordinate, but who knows the universal system is saying where we are. And then here's all the annotation tracks showing you different features, which are all completely customizable. You can turn anyone on or off, change the way it's showing to you um, in a way that uh, best suits whatever thing you're trying to look at. The genome browser is also, also completely interactive. So all the objects that you see in front of you are clickable. And so, for example, here we're looking at the track of gene annotations, one particular one. Uh, it's called the UCSC genes track. If, for example, you take one of those isoforms and click on it, you'll be brought up to a page then that has lots of links out to many different things. And so, like I say, as a geneticist, I find the UCSC genome browser my kind of go-to place. If ever I'm just like, oh, what's this gene? I type it into the browser because then I suddenly have links to pretty much anything I would ever want to know about that gene or that region or something. It's you know, way better than doing PubMed or something because there are links to PubMed in here if that's what you want to see. There are also links to tons of other stuff. 
if you click on other kind of tracks like this, here we're looking at um, conservation, so how conserved the different bits of DNA across here, um, 100 different vertebrates. It will bring up, for example, data on how that track was generated, what are all the species going into it, the phylogenies, you can switch things on and off. And then, for example, down here at the bottom, we have single nucleotide polymorphisms from the DBSync database. And again, if you were to click on one of those, you would see more information about it. The ID of that variant, where it is, it will tell you what the variant is, if there's data on frequency, how common that variant is in different populations, what the two alleles are, what chimps have. And so that tells us what the ancestral and derived alleles are, so all kinds of stuff. An ECSC genome browser, as I said, has been around for, I think, since about 2000 it first came out. As its name suggests, it's run from University of California, Santa Cruz. There's a specific group there, which I think has around 30 or 40 people working in it. So it's a big team that maintains this. And it's basically run by um, David Hausler and Jim Kent, who's a kind of a funky guy. He used to be a gaming uh, engineer and now turned his attention to doing genomics. And if you want, you can go into that and see all the kind of information about that there. All right, so let's start off. If you want to do like a basic search, if you know, we're interested in a particular gene, let's say, how do we do that? So this is sort of landing site for the ECSC Genome Browser, although they've actually added on a new page about a week ago as their hub site, but it's basically the same thing. And just to orientate you, there's some information at the top. We have some specific sort of things that they'll tell you if there are updates, if there's going to be like a new release of the, of the genome sequence or something coming out. They'll, they'll tell you about it here and, and you, you kind of will know if something new has come out. And then we have the bars here, either at the top or down the side, which basically enable you to navigate to different things. So for example, you could go to different genomes, some of these tools I'll explain later, things like BLAT, the table browser, are all accessible there. If we then were to click simply on uh, genomes here or genome browser here, it's going to take you to this page. And here you start to be able to select your very basic things of what do I actually want to look at. So the UCSC genome browser was originally developed for looking at the human genome. There are now, I have no idea how many genomes are in there, probably more than 100, all different kinds of organisms. So your first very basic thing is you, if you work on human that is, you would want to choose mammal and human, that's the default settings. And then some very important things, we'll explain a little bit more, is the assembly. Do you want to go find there for a minute? I'll just introduce Mafalda. <laughs> so Mafalda's our other TA, along with Felix. Um, and if people have any questions or things, just stick your hand up and one of these two can help out. So yeah, so you have your assembly where you choose which version of a genome you're looking at. As I say, in humans, we're now up to uh, uh, build 38 is the most recent one. Um, then you have your search space of where, if you want to go to a particular chromosome or a chromosome band or a gene, you type it in. And the nice thing about the UCSC Genome Browser is, is it's really well annotated. There's lots of help information there. So for example, if you just scroll down here, it'll tell you some different search terms you can use. You can search by chromosome. Be careful when you do that, because if you have lots of tracks switched on, it might take like two minutes to load the page, um, particularly if you have really data heavy tracks. It's going to try and load data for like uh, 200 million base pairs or something. Or you can type in a gene name or a chromosome band or a SNP ID or whatever you want. Okay, so to start with, I could say we'd want to, if we're going to be looking at human, we would choose mammal. But as I say, there are all kinds of other things there. Each one of these um, kingdoms, or, or, or missing my phylogeny, but uh, classes of animal. Um, will have many different um, organisms within it. So you can see even within mammals, there are a variety of primates, all kinds of other stuff that's been uh, sequenced now. Naked mole rat, if you're really interested in that, the genome's right there. I can't overemphasize how important this one is. I've said before, I guarantee everybody in this room will waste part of their life working on a, the wrong version of uh, a build of a genome. So always, 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 whenever you're doing anything with the genome or any genome sequence, if somebody says, oh, here's my data, or you're downloading something from a paper or whatever, you get some array data back, something, always the first question you always want to ask yourself is, what build of a genome is this, whether it's human or mouse or rat or something? Because some people will work in an older build, they'll have their data, they'll send it to you, there's coordinates, everything looks fine. They forget to tell you what build they were working in because people do that. You forget to ask, you'll spend a week of your life 
mixing their data with yours, intersecting things, and then you get to the end and go, oh, this is really weird. I only get two hits, and I was expecting like 10,000. Um, and then you ask them, and they go, oh, yeah, we're using you know, build 36, and you're working in build 37, and you've just wasted a week of your life. Yeah. So yeah, so these slides were made a little while ago. There's a newer build now. Uh, it's called GRCH38. Um, they've dropped the HG numbering just to confuse everybody. I, it's sort of legacy things. You know, a lot of projects take many years to run. So there's a decision made at this point. We're going to work in HG18, and three years later, you're still doing that project. If you're halfway through, you've done tons of analysis. It's a kind of a pain in the butt to say halfway through. All right, let's change everything we've done. All the coordinates of all these different data sets to a new build of the genome. You can do it, but it's there's always going to be some headaches. Um, people don't always adopt the newer builds immediately. I would say for the last few releases of the genome, I would say that you know they don't get commonly adopted until at least six or 12 months after they've been released. The reason for that is usually when the initial build is done, it will be put up, for example, on the UCSC genome browser and it's there, but a lot of the annotations that I'll show you in a minute, um, only usually the basic ones are done. So for example, it'll tell you where genes are, or common SNPs and repeats, and not much else. So suddenly, if a new build of the genome comes out and you're really interested in intersecting all these other data sets, they'll be there in some of the older builds, because people have had time to add all that annotations on, but not put a new one. So everyone's like, okay, let's just wait a bit until everything's populated and lifted over, and then we'll start using it. Where can you find out how much has been in common across all the builds? Like, have, there's been builds coming up over and over again. Has anyone said anything to what stays the same across no matter what your code you're using? Um, when you say s stays the same, you mean like genes or? Yeah, so, okay, so for example, genes, I think it's pretty well accepted now that there aren't really any genes sort of missing from, from the reference. But let me qualify that statement. There are certainly many genes that are multi-copy, where some of those copies are not represented in certain builds. I showed you some of those, like these tandemly repeated genes, where you know there's two copies listed in the genome, and actually you're walking around with 20 copies of. But the gene is there. Um, so what changes as some of these builds get updated is usually they'll fix some of these regions where it was previously not well annotated or a gap, and say, all right, now we've finally sequenced across this gap, and they'll put a revised sequence. So. Um, I would say starting with HG17, and nobody uses HG17 anymore, you'll still some see some people publishing in HG18, but if you submitted a paper now where you've done things in HG18, probably a review is going to say, update this, you should be using HG19 at least. HG19 right now is the most commonly used assembly. It's not the most recent, but it's what most people are still working in. Um, but yeah, starting from HG17, I would say that was sort of a really high quality assembly. And in these last three updates since then, the changes have been relatively small, you know, 1% or something of the genome, and it's usually in the certain bits of DNA that are complicated, have these weird structures where the gaps are. You know, 99% of the sequence is not changing. The coordinates associated with that a gene will differ, but essentially there'll be big chunks of the DNA that are directly comparable from you know, HG18 to HG19, and maybe there'll just be a complicated region that somebody resolves that will now shift everything after that, the coordinates off. So yeah, I'd say at this point, it doesn't really, it's not gonna affect your research or whatever, what build of the genome you're using in. Like, it's not like your results are gonna be 10 times better using a new build. That may be like 0.2% better. <laughs> um, it's more, people expect you to kind of update things that you're using for, for publication. But yeah, always know what build of the genome you're working in. If you ever get data from anywhere else, always know what build it is, because everybody makes that mistake. And once you've done it once or twice, you remember, you know, check. But I still do it, so. And yeah, over here is our search box, where you type in whatever you want. All right, so this is one other really, uh, I'd say, basic but important thing. If everyone has their genome browser open right now, there's this box over here, I if you actually open up the browser as well, it will still be there. This configure tracks and display. A lot of people don't know about that, and usually if you've never opened the genome browser, it will open up with this default setting of an image width, width of 1,000 pixels, which 
maybe 15 years ago was the width of a screen. These days, it's maybe two or three times that. Yeah. If you, if you just click on something, you'll get to click a page that looks very much. So you guys are all on this page? Yeah. 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 All right, so just click on go. And then Andy's talking about configure, which is, sorry, I don't have it blown up, but. Uh, It'll be there, like, there's a small configure just below the, the yeah, the picture of the, the browser. Uh, browser. So yeah, so if you, if you can see um, Felix's screen, his, <laughs> His genome browser is only filling up about one third of or half the width of his screen. That's yeah. the default, which is I guess 1,000 pixels. Probably your display is like 19, 20 pixels wide. Yeah. So a lot of people are sitting there looking at this tiny box and like, do just like make it wider. So <laughs> set that to like 18, 1900, and now it'll be shown the full width of your screen. Um, so let me bring this up. All right. So if we go to genome browser, yeah. So they've just uh, literally about a week ago they added in this new landing page, just to update things, I guess. Um, so if you just hit go, now you actually have your genome browser page open. <coughs> so the configure, where are you? Uh, right here. So if I hit that, you're going to have this. And it's somebody's already sized it, but if I hit that to like 800, um, sometimes it's nice to make, if you're old like me, make the text size a bit bigger. Um, another thing that I would say is a preference some people like or don't like is uh, they'll have these light blue vertical lines. If I untick that and now hit submit, you now see I've lost all those blue lines. It's shrunk a bit in the width and the text is a little bigger. So you can play around with that. If I put those back and then make it a thousand again. Now you see it's wider and I've got these light blue lines back. So, you know, just the very basics, set it up the way you like it. Everyone likes it a bit different. Oop, I need to bring this back. So yeah, like I say, if anyone has things at any point, just look at Felix or Mathalda and they can help you out, hopefully. But these are good things to bring up as well. So yeah, so you'd want to choose your organism, Choose your build, know which one it is, and then you can start searching. And there's your configuration. Okay, so let's say we want to start off by doing something really simple. We're going to look at human, look at the February 2009 assembly. So confusingly, all the assemblies have at least two, or the older ones, at least three different names. So for example, HG19, the most commonly used one now, is called February 2009. It wasn't actually released then. That's when they started building it. It was released about three years after that. It's also called GRCH37 and also called HG19. Don't ask me why. It is. And we're going to look for a gene called TP53. So you just go up to your search box here, type in TP53, and then hit submit over there on the right. And what you're going to get is a big box that gives you all the things that correspond to TP53. And you might go, wow, that's really confusing. Why did I get hits all the way down to the floor? The reason is, is because P53 has lots of different splice forms. So if you look, you'll see these are all transcript variant 8, 2, 8, 1, 5, 3, 4. There are various different splice forms where one exon or one, you know, is included or spliced out or a different length or something. There are also multiple tracks. So for example, gene annotations, there's RefSeq, there's Ensemble, there's Vega, there's UCSC genes. So you get all the hits in all of those too. So you have to start making choices of like, which is your favorite one. I personally like RefSeq. Um, some people like UCSC genes, whatever. So like I said, there will be results in RefSeq. Each one of these, hopefully if you guys are looking at this, will have its own little header. So you can choose, okay, yeah, I, I really like ensemble genes, so I'm going to look in here. And you may get some other weird stuff. Some genes have homologs or pseudogenes that may also come up. You know, they'll have TP53 as part of their name, but there'll be other stuff too, so just be aware. And sometimes it will even bring up things like you know, this is the homologue of that in mouse or something. So it won't give you stuff in a different organism, but it will give you things that have that string in its name that may be completely different to what you're actually searching for. Okay, so we're, these are slides I, I doctored from somewhere else, but this is what they're searching for. So if we were to actually click on that, and for example, I just showed you the, the browser window. That's what it actually looks like. 
So let me just do this here. So we're going to type in TP53. Oh, that just reminds me. That so, yeah, there's more than 500 hits for TP53. So as you just saw, a really nice feature that's there is there's a dynamic search, just kind of like on Google, where if you type in something, if you know exactly what it is you're looking for, so let's say CFTR, cystic fibrosis gene, that's going to come up and say, oh, is this what you're looking for, the CFTR gene? And rather than giving you that list of 500 different hits, you can just click straight on that. It'll insert the coordinates of where that is. So I know that gene's on chromosome 7, and you can go straight there. So it's just kind of a shortcut way. So now it's actually opened up that region of the genome, and you're looking at all the different, or uh, some of the different annotations that correspond to that. If you scroll down below, these are all the different tracks that are available to you, for you to look at. So there's a lot of information. Some of these are shrunk down. And the nice thing about all of these is they're completely interactive. So every time you see, for example, you know, a name there, you can click on that, and it will take you to a page that gives you options on how you can display that information, but it also gives you a description. So you know, some pages you'll be looking at and go, I have no idea what that is. So for example, let's say GWAS catalog. You're like, uh, I'm not really sure what that is, or Cosmic. Let's say Cosmic. Here's a description of what Cosmic is. It gives you a, often a reference, so you can go and see a paper, see how that was generated. There'll be a website where maybe that data was originally coming from. Sometimes there'll be individuals you can contact if you have questions. So it will tell you information about what the display is. So if you're switching that on and looking at it, you're like, what does it mean if this is blue versus green versus red? It'll tell you right here. Like I say, here's some references. And yeah, we even have a contact. So yeah, so these are really useful for understanding what it is you're looking at. So yeah, so this will be the full page. That's where we look at the genome, and I've just gone through all this. So just to orientate you, things are kind of grouped together in categories that hopefully make some reasonable sense. So at the top, we have mapping and sequencing. A lot of that's sort of historical about how the genome assembly was made, you know, the backs that went into it, things like that. But there's some really useful tracks in here too. I'll talk you through a couple of those in a bit. Then we have genes and gene predictions. So there's all these, you know, 20 different varieties of gene annotation. Take your pick which one you like. Things like phenotypes and diseases. So I just mentioned Cosmic, Decipher, uh, GWAS catalog. So you can look up where, you know, GWAS variants linked with certain disease are. They'll be listed here. Links to PubMed papers. So if there's a certain gene, that you can click on that. It'll take you to PubMed link. This one's related to genes, just mRNAs and ESTs. This is basically uh, EST is expression something tag. Um, Sequence tag, that's right, thank you. These are basically much less well annotated, reliable versions of the genes and gene predictions. They're just like somebody once found a, a something that came out of an RNA sequencing experiment or something, or a, something they cloned and it will be listed there. Expression data, so you can see how highly a certain gene is expressed in a different tissue. Epigenetic data, so annotation from things like ENCODE of transcription factor binding sites, DNA methylation, you know, histone modifications, DNA type sensitivity sites. This in itself is a massive, each one of these tracks you can dig into and there will be like data for 130 cell lines of, you know, 200 different ChIP-seq experiments. So that's enormous in, it in itself. Comparative genomics, you can compare across species. Um, and then some others that I guess they've shrunk them because unless you're really interested in Neanderthals, you probably wouldn't care so much. And then the bottom, some other just basic ones telling you where Variations are SNP variations, copy number variations, common repeats, tandem repeats, just some basic annotations of the genome. So once you kind of get to know those, you can basically customize your display up here, what's being shown, switch on and off things that you like or don't like. I usually try and keep my display as simple as possible because otherwise you're downloading tons of data that you don't care about and it just makes it messy to look at. One of the other basic things is it's completely sort of interactive. So if we go back here, customizable. So for example, right now here we have RefSeq genes. So I really like RefSeq genes. I can just drag that and put it on top. Or, you know, if I want to look at that next to the conservation, I can drag it up there. So now we'll put the RefSeq genes back on top so I can see that much better. You know, if they're separated by 20 other tracks, it's hard. And we're going to focus mostly on human because that's what I like. But um, like I said, there's tons of other species in there. Each species if you're interested in those, are basically shown in exactly the same format. You know, everything's done in the same underlying software. 
but there may be their own different tracks that are available in one species and not in another. That's actually the same is true for the human genome. There are some tracks that are available, for example, in HD18 that are not available in HD19 or vice versa. Um, so for example, if you're really interested in SNPs found in the Thousand Genomes Project, you're not going to find them in HD18, but they are there in HD19. But there's equally some data that you may be really interested in that's in the older builds that's not in the new ones. It's actually quite easy to swap data between builds of the human genome. There's an inbuilt tool that I'll show you um, called Liftover. You sometimes get some issues of where the genomes are not quite the same. You're asking how similar are they between builds where things don't lift over, but usually 99% of the stuff does. Okay. Okay, so we go back. Here's our original search, the P53 gene. So we have here all these different hits, even within the UCSC genes track of all the different splice variants. Very basic stuff. Here's the coordinate where we're looking at in the genome. So we have chromosome, and that's separated by a colon. This first number. Uh, 7.5 megabases, that's the start position. So on the left side, the second, uh, we have a, have a hyphen, and then the stop coordinate. So this is a very basic format called a bed format, browser ex extendable data, which basically has, uh, actually I'm lying. This is UCSC format, basically chromosome start, stop is your basic way of navigating around the genome. So we're looking at chromosome 17, the start to the stop coordinate over on the right. This is really useful as well, it shows you what size of region you're looking at. So if ever you click on something, you're like, am I looking at 2 KB or 200 KB? It tells you right there. You're showing 19 KB of the genome right now. So you just get an idea of scale. And that's also indicated here by this scale bar. You can switch that on or off in preferences if you like. I like it. So it just gives you a, an eyeball of, you know, how wide is this bit of my browser I'm looking at. And then they also have these tick marks that are dynamic, depending on how much you zoom in or out, that tells you, you know, here's every you know, 5 KB or something. And then there's all the other different tracks here that we can all switch on or off. So you would scroll down below and go down to, if you don't want RefSeq, you go down to the RefSeq track and you just click hide and, and refresh and it will disappear. So the UCSC Genome Browser shows data to you, not only just with the, sorry, with the, the tracks that we're looking at here, but you'll notice some of them have different colors on them or different thicknesses of lines, and those all mean certain things depending on the track. So for example, a basic way of showing data is with these tick marks, just saying here is a SNP. SNPs are always one, well, usually one base pair. Some of them are actually more than one base pair. But that will just show you the location in the genome, but then th they can be colored different ways. That will annotate, for example, if something is coding or non-coding or synonymous or non-synonymous. So there's information content there. If we're looking at things like genes, there is considerable information given about that. So for example, coding exons are shown by the thick bars, three and five prime untranslated regions are shown by the thin bars, and then the introns are shown by the line, but in addition you have arrows that are telling you the direction of transcription. So some genes are on the forward strand, some are transcribed on the reverse strand, you can see that straight away just by the direction of the arrows. So even if you don't know which is the start or stop of the gene, the arrows, and you go, okay, this must be the start because it's going that way. And then the colors have meaning depending on the track. Often you have to dig in, click on that hyperlink at the, you know, down below in the track that I just showed you, and it will tell you, you know, dark blue is this, light blue is that. It varies from track to track. So in this example, uh, in the UCSC genes track, black, if there's a, a public database, it's a well-curated, you know, everyone's like, yes, this is a real gene. If there's a validated sequence, it's dark blue. If it's much more fuzzy, like not people aren't 100% sure if that's real or there's you know, differing levels of evidence, it will be light blue. So it gives you some idea of confidence of you know, how sure am I that that's real. Another type of data format that's shown a lot in the UCSC Genome Browser is called this wiggle format. So the advantage of this format, unlike just the tick, which is showing your position, or this form actually is showing you other information like you know, coding versus uh, non-coding bits of genes, this wiggle format enables you to show quantitative data. So for any one base pair, or depending on how far zoomed out you are, it will give you, for example, you know, if here we're looking at conservation, the higher the bar, the more conserved that is across different vertebrate species. And then other things can be shown in different colors. So this is something called the um, chain or net style. It's good for looking at synteny across different organisms. So it's kind of related to the conservation. So it just shows you the blocks of conserved sequence here from mouse to dog to horse to armadillo. 
Okay, so other basic things in the browser you can move around. So obviously once you've first entered here, we've decided we want to look at this P53 gene. Say we want to go, oh, what's upstream or downstream of that gene? You have your buttons here. The single arrow is, I think that moves 10 or 20% of the window, left or right. The double arrow moves half the window. So in this case, you'd move just under 10 KB one way or the other. The triple arrow moves the full window width. So that if you hit that one left, you're going to go basically look at the next 19 KB this side. You also have zoom buttons, so you can zoom in or out. You can even zoom to an individual base if you want to. Um, not that useful most of the time. I think they've actually updated this, and there's now a zoom out 100x button as well, which is kind of nice. Often if you enter like a SNP ID, it'll give you just a few bases around that SNP, and you're like, okay, I want to see the context here. Or you could just do it manually. So this is the coordinate we were looking at, and you say, oh, I just want to add on 2KB upstream. You would just click on there. This coordinate would appear in here, and you can just manually edit it and just say, all right, I want to look at, you know, 569, and it will add on 2KB this side. So I, I use that a lot too. And as I showed you, these are customizable, so you can just grab these, move them up or down, change the ordering, whatever you want. Another nice feature is you can manually zoom. So if you just hold your mouse, click uh, on the top scale tracker here and draw a window, what it's going to do is zoom to that region. So say you're looking at a big region of like a megabase, and you're like, oh, I'm really interested in that one, but you just zoom on it, and it will straight away take you to that. And you can right-click as well and then change various options. So if you right-click on a track, you can change the view option for that track, go straight to the DNA sequence for that gene. It will depend on what track you click on, what options it's going to give you. So another very basic thing just to understand is the different viewing options for looking at a track. So most tracks you can change. They can either be hidden, which is the default for a lot of tracks when you first go into the browser, or you can view that. And then for many tracks, there are different views that you can uh, uh, kind of choose to look at. It'll often depend on what the nature of the track is and how big a region you're looking at, what works best. I said all of these things are clickable, I think. Yeah, so if, for example, we were to click on um, you know, one of these tracks here, and you know, guys, try this as you're looking, you can change the track view from hide, where you're not seeing it at all, to dense. So dense will just show things basically in this format. So this repeat masker track is shown in dense. All you see is you know, yes or no, is, is the repeat annotated there or not. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not very informative. We can't tell what kind of repeat that is, if that's one big line element, or is it made up of a ton of different repeats all smushed together. Um, so you could change that to, for example, squish. So let's switch on, a nice way of showing it is the segmental duplications. I'm going to switch off a bunch of these just to make it cleaner. And the other thing you notice, tracks that are hidden are always shown in gray, whereas ones that are not hidden are, are white, so images that easier to see. All right, I'll hit refresh. So a lot of that stuff's now going to disappear. Suddenly it's got a lot cleaner. So let's say we're interested in segmental duplications. Um, currently that's on dense display, and let's go to 15Q1.2 is our chromosome band. So the segmental duplication track right now is shown in dense mode, so we can just see where the location of those are. If we were to click down and go to the segmental duplication track, it's going to tell us this is what the coloring means. Mm. So basically, the coloring going from light gray all the way up to orange is telling us how similar are those bits of DNA to each other. The brighter the color, the more similar they are. So if we just go back, that's dense mode. If I now zip down, I'm going to change that to squish. What squish does is showing them each individual element that's there as a thin line, and they're packed together in a sort of efficient way as possible. So now we can see each individual piece of duplicated sequence and with the coloring system, the homology, and you also notice here there's arrows that's telling us the orientation of each piece of DNA uh, relative to its, its duplicated friend. The next one up that gives us more information content is packed. So now you notice that these narrow bars become much wider. It still tries to show the data in a, the most efficient way possible, but now you'll notice because we're looking at five megabases, that's the size of chromosome band 15Q1.2, the red box here is showing us where on the chromosome we're looking. You can see that because there's a lot of them in this region, even in pack mode, 
It's kind of crazy. It's like, okay, we have to scroll all the way down just to see them. Squish mode was probably better for that size of region. And then if we go to the full one, it's going to get really crazy and actually not very useful in this mode, or this zoom at least, because now each item has its own line. And so we have, you know, two yards of data just for that region. So that's not very useful in this context. But say we were to zoom in and say, oh, I'm only interested in that bit. You know, now full mode is not so bad just because we're looking at a much smaller region with less data to display. Does that kind of make sense? So again, you kind of have to get used to the tracks, how they behave. Uh, different views are, are better in different circumstances. Some tracks work best in some views, not so good in others. So for example, repeat masker, I always like to have that in full. Dense mode is not very informative, just a black bar. If I show it in full, now I see the signs, the lines, the other different kinds of element that are there. And again, the color indicates their percent identity to the consensus. So light gray means it's a very old element, it's accumulated mutations. Dark gray or black means it's a much newer one it inserted more recently in human evolution. Everything I just explained to you is right here. So yeah, it's a hide, obviously you can't see it. Dense, everything's in a single line. Squish, everything's small and tiny, but sometimes that's good if there's a ton of data to show. Pack, each item is separate, but still multiple items can be on a single line to make it most, most efficient. And then full, each item has its own separate line. And sometimes that's horrible. If you're looking at a big region with a lot of data, like SNPs in a megabase, you're gonna have, <laughs> you'll be scrolling all day just to get to the bottom of the page. So again, sometimes be aware of what you're asking the browser to tell you, because you can, you're not gonna break it, but you'll be sitting there churning for five minutes if you say, show me chromosome 21 with SNP shown in full display mode, like it's gonna try and download like a million lines <laughs> and show it to you. So don't do that. And for some of the tracks, these items, uh, the different view modes <coughs> will have extra data. So if you click on the link here, you can choose the mode, but then it will also say, do you want even more information shown in different ways? You can say, hey, show me things in different colors, depending on what I'm interested in, you know, color bases, different ways, stuff like that. So it's really customizable. So for example here, if you want, you know, we're looking at ESTs expressed in a neuroblastoma cell line, and you say, I want it in red, suddenly all the ones, the ESTs from neuroblastoma are in red, all the others are in black. So maybe that'd be useful to you. Other tracks, like I mentioned, a lot of regulatory information that's coming from ENCODE have just massive amounts of data buried in them. Like, you know, it'll just be one little thing that you can say, view in normal mode, but when you dig into it, you find there's a ton of stuff there. So for example, this transcription factor binding site track, if you wanted to look at the raw data, you can do that. You would go in, this in itself is a massive page, it's a matrix of all the different cell lines that were studied as a part of the ENCODE project, every different transcription factor that CHIP was done on, and you could display each and every one of those if you wanted in every cell line looking at even the most basic data. So here this is basically showing you the intensity of the peaks, so the number of reads map per region for, you know, here, Pol2 in GM12878 cell line. So you could, uh, again, have a, a thousand different tracks there if you really wanted. So yeah, so a lot of these you can go right into. You might just be interested in, oh, I really like, you know, this transcription factor in Hep G2 if you're studying uh, liver, that is. So, you know, you can kind of pick and choose to show what you want. There are other basic things. So if you've changed a whole bunch of stuff, you've changed it, moved the way the order all the tracks are shown, you can just say hit it back to default and it'll put everything back. Or you can just hide everything so you don't have to individually click all those individual tracks and switch them off. I explain the configure. If you're really crazy and you think opposite to everybody else, you can flip it around. Don't ask me why. Or that button will just fit it to your, your the window to your browser. Another really useful but basic thing is you can basically create a login and, and then it will remember things that you've done. So yeah, so if you go to this My Data at the top, I don't think this has changed. They occasionally they'll change the, the heading so something that you used to know was there is not there anymore. It's been buried in a different heading. If you go to Sessions, you can create a login. You know, say you're running three different projects and you want one thing where you're doing RNA-seq data and as I'll explain later, maybe you've uploaded some custom tracks. You can create a session, it will remember that you don't have to go back and upload it every time. The other nice thing about that is you can share it with people. So say you have, 
you've done a bunch of poking around, you've uploaded some of your data to the browser, you've got a really nice view that you think explains some concepts that you're interested in really well. If you've logged in and saved it as a session, you can then get a, a link and send it to somebody else and they can open up exactly the view in the genome browser that you were looking at yourself. You know, with all the same tracks switched on and off with the same settings. So that's a nice feature in there as well. And that data, if you upload stuff in a session, it'll last four months before it's deleted. All right. So everything in the browser that you ever look at is all, as I say, fundamentally based on A's, T's, C's, and G's in a coordinate system. But uh, in addition, like I said, it, I, I like it as a, a really nice hub site. So if ever I'm interested in anything, UCSC Genome Browser, I find, is the best place to go. So for example, if I'm in UCSC Genes and I click on one of these gene uh, uh, annotations, it's going to bring up this page with all these other links to tons of stuff. So in fact, just that one page actually looks this big, like it's huge. And so I just showed you the top here with this links to the sequence, the RNA structure, array data, pathways, that gene's involved in the protein structure, that gene and other species, uh, diseases it's associated with, go annotations, blah, 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 all kinds of stuff. And that's all shown here. So, you know, if you really like the protein structure, it's shown right there. So you don't need to start digging around in some protein database. You can just go to the UCSC genome browser and with two clicks, you've got the protein structure right there. Or how that gene is expressed in 20 different tissues or whatever you want. So all that stuff, you know, is shown really nicely. Again, you kind of, it's good to poke around and get to know sort of what you like. So, So let's put RefSeq to pack. So here in this display, uh, let's go to back to CFTR again. Blah, 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 blah. The one RefSeq annotation. So that's CFTR. Um, if I switch back on UCSC genes again. So here, just as a basic difference, RefSeq says there is only a single isoform of CFTR. UCSC gene says no, there's two. So, you know, again, always choices in genomics, like which one do you believe? You'll get different answers if you use that one versus that one. Um, so yeah, so if we click on the UCSC gene, this is all the information for CFTR. You know, so here's expression data from GTEx saying it's most highly expressed in pancreas. Um, there's the protein structures you know, tons of different information. If I go back and click on the RefSeq, I like this one because it gives me an instant link to, this is the mRNA sequence, the coding sequence, the OMIM entry. So I could, you know, go straight to OMIM on CFTR and it's gonna tell me all about cystic fibrosis, all the papers ever published on that, you know. I can go to <coughs> the PubMed link straight away, all kinds of other stuff. So again, there's just a ton of information buried in here. Once you get to know where it is, it's a really fast way for finding out stuff. But let's say we actually want to get the DNA. Like I said, the all the genome browser is fundamentally looking at A's, T's, C's, and G's. This is all annotation on top of it. There's several ways to do that. I just showed you if we click on you know, the UCSC genome link, I can straight away pull up the mRNA sequence, which would be the untranslated regions plus the exons, or I can get it to tell me the introns too, or whatever I want. The easiest way to do it though, is you just go to view and DNA. What that will basically do is it will take you to a default page that it will show you the DNA for exactly what you're looking at right now. So 19, 1,449 bases. So again, it just says, hey, this is the position. Is that what you want? Do you want to add anything? upstream or downstream, um, and how do you want me to give you that data? Do you want it all in uppercase, all in lowercase? Do you want me to tell you where the repeats are? Do you want me to mask those to N or just show them as lowercase? Do you want me to do some funky stuff? Do you want me to color it? So for example, say we wanted to get the sequence for you know, TP53, this region, and in addition, I wanted to know where the common SNPs are within that sequence. You can go into this extended uh, case color options and say, yeah, highlight common SNPs, and these are just, you know, the computational color codes that it will tell you under here. 
Um, and you hit go, and then what you'll get is this. So here is our 19KB uh, that we just asked for. And what it's done is shown the coding regions in blue, the introns in black, and it's also highlight highlighted common variants. So maybe that's useful for you. Anyone still following along? Anyone not following? Okay. Everything's great, apparently. And yeah, so I showed you, if you click on these items, you can get all this other information. And yeah, if you click on here, you can get, like I say, if you say, oh, I only want to see the five prime UTR of that gene, you will unclick the other boxes, and when you say get sequence, it will just give you the five prime UTR. Or if you just want the introns, it will tell you that. Or I want to know 1KB upstream as well. You just type that in there. Or if you want the protein, you can click on there, and there's the protein, the amino acid sequence of what PP53 makes. And so, you know, you may just want to copy that and you could do something else with it. And something else you may want to do with it might be say, all right, if I take that mRNA sequence of P53 that I just pulled up, and what I'm going to do is ask where else in the genome looks similar to TP53. So BLAP, as I mentioned, forget exactly what it stands for, but it's basically a nucleotide or also an amino acid search algorithm. It's very much like BLAST, but it's about 500 times faster. I think they've actually slightly changed it. I think it's hidden under the tools link now. I don't think it has its own specific link. There you go, BLAST-like alignment tool. So here's some just information about BLAP. Um, basically, it's really fast because of the way that the genome is indexed, I believe, into 36 MERS that it looks for a short match to. Kind of works like many of the um, high throughput sequencing sort of uh, mapping algorithms. Unlike BLAT, it's basically tuned to only show you high similarity matches, so you're not going to get a lot of spurious or lower homology hits. The other thing is it does have a minimum, so I believe anything less than 24 base pairs, you're not guaranteed to get a hit because the way the genome is indexed into 36 MERS, it depends on how your 24 MER overlaps those 36 MER chunks the genome was indexed into, you may or may not get a hit. So it will still often give you a hit for like 20 MERS. Certainly I wouldn't use it for anything less than a 20 MER. There's a paper on it if you want to read about it. So basically if you go to the BLAT, which I say is now I think hidden under tools BLAT, um, again, you say, what genome am I searching in? So again, human, HD19. Usually you can just plug in your sequence and it'll figure out if you gave it DNA or RNA or, or, um, or protein. You can paste sequences directly into this box. You can upload sequences or even a file of multiple sequences. It has a maximum search size of 25 KB. And basically what it does is whatever you plug in, it's going to spit out and say this is where there was homology to that sequence in the genome. So we plugged in our messenger RNA sequence for P53 that we just grabbed earlier, hit submit. And you'll get a page that comes back that looks like this. So this actually tells you a lot of stuff. It is sorted in a way that every alignment, so we plugged in the messenger RNA sequence for, for P53, so what we would expect, it'll basically give a score to say, you know, how good a match did I get there. So it's sorted by score, the best hit is at the top. It gives you these links, so you could go straight to the browser, where did that hit? You can look at the details of the specific alignment. And then all this other stuff over here is really important because it tells you, okay, the piece of sequence that we searched for was 2,591 base pairs. That's what we input and said, where does that 2,591 base pairs match? The RNA sequence for P53. And then the really important things I'd say to look at are not only the score, <coughs> which is informative as a sort of aggregate statistic, but these other things here. So identity, so that's saying of the 2.5 KB I put in, what was the degree of match to the result I'm telling you where that hit? So it's saying that hit chromosome 17, this place, which as we'd expect is where P P53 is in the genome, so it's hitting itself, that's good. And it's saying I hit it with a 100% match, so all 2,591 bases aligned. And the alignment started at base 1 of my input and ended at base 2,591 of my input, i.e. the entire sequence that I put in aligned with 100% identity. But look over here. So it's saying 
even though I aligned the entire sequence with 100% identity, from the start to the end position of where that match was in the genome is 19 KB. So think about that. We've searched by inputting a 2.5 KB sequence and it says it matched perfectly, but it spanning a region of 19 KB. Now, because we put in an RNA and we were just looking at that and we know there are introns and exons, we can interpret that there are gaps in the alignment which correspond to basically the introns of the gene because we input the RNA sequence that it's the aligning of the exons, the ETRs, but the introns don't align because they weren't in our query that we input. But it's saying the span of this whole match is much bigger than the input, i.e. there are gaps in it. So even though it has a 100% match with the full sequence and a really great score, there's something else that's really important is this. And depending on what you input and maybe what you're expecting or not, like you need to interpret these things. So if we go down and look at some of the other hits, you'll see the scores are much lower, so straight away that's telling you, okay, probably it didn't match the whole thing. This one is saying 83% of the sequence that I found a match for aligned perfectly, i.e. there are some bases that didn't match. This one's hitting on chromosome one, so a completely different chromosome, and it's saying, I out of the 2.5 KB, only 177 bases matched on this region of chromosome one with 83% identity. But again, the span of those hundred, uh, sorry. I take that back completely. Sorry, so it matched 2.1 to 2.4 KB, so about 300 base pairs match with 83% identity for this span. So basically you need to kind of consider what was the region of my match versus the span with the identity and look at it holistically beyond just the score. I don't know if I've lost people there, maybe. So <coughs> if we wanted to look at this one, we would just click on the browser and it would take us back now it's added in a new track that says, hey, this is your BLAP search, and this is the alignment. And as you would expect, because we input the RNA sequence, the dark, thick lines are saying that's where the alignment was. The thin line with, uh, you know, without the bar are the bits that didn't align, and that obviously corresponds perfectly with the introns and exons of the gene, because that's what we search for. Does that make sense? Not? Anyone have any questions? So you might be thinking like, okay, that's great. Why would I take an RNA sequence and ask where did it hit in the genome? But a lot of the time you'll have questions. You'll be working on some piece of DNA and maybe you'll get something funky when you, I don't know, with some array probes or mapping it. Depending on what you're putting in and what maybe the question you have in your mind, you can interpret those hits and ask, okay, was that a unique piece of DNA? If I have, say, say you got a Sanger sequence back from something you sequenced, you could plug that in and say, was this really saying a sequence from what I thought I was sequencing, or maybe was my primers cross-hybridizing to something else in the genome that I didn't know about, or you know, am I amplifying the wrong thing? You can use it for lots of different stuff. Yeah, what I like to use it for is uh, if I do like differential expression or something, my top ten plug them all in, make sure what I'm seeing is true, like a little signal mapping like back and forth, mm -hmm. and knowing for RNA expression because. You have problems with read alignment, so is my top signal just a bunch of pseudo genes, like fake genes, or is it actually a real signal? Yeah, exactly. So you could just take your your RNA seq read and just plug it in and say, is this mapping to pseudo genes? Is it mapping to non-specific things? Do I believe it? You know, you could start to see maybe if there's a intron exon structure to your RNA reads. You know, by again looking at the span and whether there's gaps and whether that corresponds to some known annotations. You know, this is when you might want to start digging into some of the other tracks and saying, well, does that match with something that somebody else has found, you know. So once you kind of get to know what's in the browser and what it can tell you and using these different tools, you can, I think, get even more out of it. So. And then the other thing is your BLAP search will now appear as its own track here that you can view in different ways, you know, pack, squish, dense, whatever mode you want. And sometimes you'll, you'll have multiple black hits that can be overlapping, you know, if you're looking at really funky regions of the genome. The other thing is, in addition to having linked to the browser, where it will take us to this link, it also gives us a link to this details, which will show us the specific, uh, specific alignment. So that would look like this. 
So here it's saying, yeah, your alignment, your black search produced these different blocks, the exons and UTRs of the gene. You can look at different ones. And it will line up here. So here is basically an exon of our gene. It happens to highlight the uh, splice sites at the end, and then the lowercase stuff is uh, the introns, the bits that basically didn't align. Or you can look at it in this format, where it gives you a sort of faster style, showing you we don't have any mismatches here, but if you did, you could look at the nature of the mismatches, for example. Does anyone have any questions right now? Everything's great. Well, Everyone's the happy. Yes, we'll get onto that in a bit. So this was step one of just kind of walking you through what's in the browser and how to navigate and stuff. Um, in a bit, we'll go on to yeah, adding custom tracks, um, other data that's in there that is hidden, um, how to download data from the tracks and do stuff with it. Yeah, this is just scratching the surface. Um, yeah. Um, well, doing it yourself is probably going to be a lot of effort. <laughs> it depends what we're talking Are we talking the whole genome or one gene or yeah. the uh, whole genome? Usually, oh. um, probably just one gene. Uh, and how many species? Uh, at least 15, but many, many more. Okay, so that's going to get tedious pretty fast. Um, yeah, I mean... I know there's been other studies that have looked at some of that, characterized orthologs and tenic regions. Um, so I would start by going to some of these other papers and seeing if they've done that for you. Um, one way of doing it would be, oh man, it's not an easy question actually. I was going to say blast and pulling up stuff, but that's going to get really messy, Thanks. really fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for some genes it's going to be clean, but for other genes that have duplicated, that have been gained or lost in different species, that have part of gene families, it's going to get really messy really fast. You can't tell if I'm just picking the wrong one, the wrong, the wrong transcript, or, um, I mean, the, when you do the multiple alignment from the table browser, it looks really, really clean, but I don't know what goes in how, and how it's balanced, what is wrong. Yeah, I mean, there are, let me see. So there are, um, there's the vertebrate. I mean, are you interested in vertebrates, primates? Okay, let's do this one. Let's do the primate chain. I've got that hide. So there's this track here that's, tries, I mean, as soon as you start talking, <laughs> this is a whole field in itself for like cross-species alignments. Um, you know, even what on the surface seems as apparently a simpler question of what's the percent identity of this one KB section of the human genome to, you know, chimp, gorilla, orang, mouse, naked mole rat, whatever. Even that what seems like a simple question gets complicated fast, but it's like, okay, do you want to consider repeat insertions and deletions because there are transposons jumping around. So, you know, there may be your 1 KB may match perfectly to 1.3 KB in mouse. So depending on how you consider that, if the extra 300 base pairs in mouse is just an alu element jumping in, do you say that's 70% identity? Or do you say, well, I'm going to ignore the repeat insertions and just work with repeat mask sequence and say, well, that's 100% identity because once I chop out that alu, everything matches perfectly. Um, so yeah, I again, there's choices. Uh, there's no like right or wrong answer. I mean, I've dealt with some of these problems. One of the <laughs> guy I used to work with runs the Primate Genome Sequencing Consortium. We've <laughs> done the analysis like this, and it's just horrible. Um, 
There's this track here where they've tried to kind of do it in an, or an overview way, not doing a just you know base to base one to one local alignment, but looking more globally. This chain net where they basically try and say, yeah, this is the syntenic region in that other organism, accounting for the fact that yeah, bits get rearranged, repeat elements jump in or out that can on a base by base level can make a huge difference. But when you look globally, actually, it's like, oh yeah, this is the same thing. It's just there was an inversion and three repeat elements that jumped in or out. So that might be a good place to start and just saying, okay, here's my gene of interest in human, what's the syntenic bits in these other organisms, and what's then you could go to those regions in that other organism. It would be a manual process. Uh, I mean, I could put you in touch with people that might be better able to answer this question than me, but, because um, yeah, I know there's other things like, um, what's it called, ortho? to auto key alignments or something that people use. I'm not familiar with them, but I could put you in touch with some people that may be able to better answer your question. But yeah, it's not as simple as it sounds. Yeah, so that's when you, yeah, so that's when you need to learn and understand things about how different organisms' genomes were sequenced and assembled, what the exact methodology was, and what the quality of the data was. So, for example, the human genome, I told you, was done in a very thorough way, back-based assemblies, so large insert clones that were physically mapped and then sub-sequenced and assembled back together. That's about as good as it gets. Um, for example, when the mouse genome was first done, it wasn't done in that way. It was done with just a whole genome shotgun approach, um, kind of like the Solera assembly of the human genome, Craig Vent insertion. Um, and that's fast and cheap, but has a lot of problems, because as soon as you hit gene families, polymorphic regions, big repeats, you just get gaps, and your assembly gets highly fragmented or just missing completely. So yeah, so the mouse genome, initially it was done with this whole genome shotgun approach, so everyone's like, oh, that worked pretty well for Craig Venter, so let's just do it for mouse, because we don't want to spend 10 years doing this again, and everyone's like, oh, no, actually, it doesn't work so well. So then they went back and did a back-based assembly, and it got 10 times better. Um, so yeah, every genome was done in a different way, you know, especially once you go down to some of the rarer kind of organisms. Often they were just done in somebody's lab where they said, oh yeah, we did 7x Sanger sequence or we did 454 sequencing or whatever. Or sometimes it was done with low coverage back assembly, you know, with high coverage, something else on top. You kind of have just have to understand the effect that's going to have on the genome. Usually the summary statistics, things like the N50 contig size, that's basically a measurement of what's the median size of each contiguous chunk of DNA. So in humans, for example, there's uh, 290 odd gaps in the most recent assembly, so the average contig size is really big, tens of megabases. In, I don't know, something like orangutan, which was not done in any much like the same way, but I don't know what the N50 is, maybe like 50 KB or something. In other words, the genome is really shattered into pieces. And there's a lot of places where it's like, well, this piece could be that way or that way because there's a gap and then there's something else next door. And in that case, asking questions <laughs> of like what's, you know, orthologous between the genomes or if you're wanting to look at large scale structure, like I wouldn't even bother asking those questions because the genome isn't high enough quality in some cases to get out a decent answer. So there's that problem too. Uh, the N50 contig length is the 50th percentile of contig size. So in other words, when they did the assembly, they spliced together all the reads, and you know you get to a point of yeah, all these ones map together, and there's a piece that's 28 KB, but then at each end they're like, I can't join that with anything else. So there's all these different contigs, um, and that's basically a measure of the median contig size. So it gives you a just a gross measure of genome assembly quality. If you're into genome assemblies, that's what people use, I think. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so 
if you go onto um, Blackboard site, I put these problem sets here. So basically they're just some simple exercises for you guys just to go through. So we can combine this with just a bit of a break if people want to go and use the bathroom, get a coffee or whatever. But if you just want to play around, you know, the best way to learn is get your hands dirty. You're not going to break it. Just try doing some of these exercises that are here. Let's say this is on the blackboard. Yeah, intro exercises, the top link. And it's just some things to start playing with. Felix and Mafalda, who are looking bored up until now, can <laughs> go around and help you. Or if people have other questions of stuff, like the one here about how do I get orthologous genes from different species, like I can help you too. So that was an overview of sort of the basic functioning, just how you navigate around the UCSC Genome Browser, some of the very basic features, you know, switching tracks on and off, moving around, querying things. The UCSC Genome Browser actually has a ton more stuff. I was just explaining somebody over here, there's various other tools you can, for example, put in PCR primers, it will tell you what those are going to amplify, it's a little thing called uh, in silico tools. Um, if you have data that's in one build of a genome, like HD18 that you got from a paper published a few years ago, now you're working in HD19, you want to use that data but it's in the wrong build, there's a tool called Liftover, let me show you that right now, um, that basically does that for you. So let's say we're here, you go up to tools, this is the in silico PCR where you can just plug in your forward and reverse primer and it'll tell you what bit of DNA in theory that should be amplifying. There's this tool here, Liftover, that's saying, all right, I have some data that's in HG19 and I want to find out the coordinates in the newest build, of what those exact same regions are, but the coordinates, you know, in the updated build. And you say there has to be 95% uh, match between the two builds. And you can either just paste in data if you have one or a small number of regions. Or if you have a lot, you can just upload a file and it'll give you a, an output of what the coordinates are of those same regions in the new build. That's not limited to switching between builds. You could even switch and say, all right, I have these regions in, I don't know, you're asking about you know, orthologs in different species. I want to know where is the coordinates of TP53 in armadillo or whatever. There's different ways you get to that. You could go to the armadillo genome and type in TP53. You could get the sequence of the human gene and then blad it or do a lift over. So you could blad it in the armadillo genome. You could grab that sequence and you could say, lift it over to the armadillo genome. So again, we already have three different ways of asking the same question that may give you different results, may not. But again, you have to understand what's, how you're getting to that endpoint. Obviously, that requires armadillo has an annotation of TP53, otherwise you're not going to find it. Maybe doing it the sequence way is better. Maybe it's worse. Maybe if armadillo is duplicated TP53, you're going to hit multiple places and you'll get confused. There are other... I'm not going to talk about this, but there's another tool here that's kind of handy sometimes, genome graphs. This is a way of plotting, you could plot quantitative data or just regions across all human chromosomes. So it will give you a chromosome kind of by chromosome view and tell you where that quantitative data is or, or something. Um, that's kind of fun to play around with if you want. And then various other tools as well. But what we're going to do here is I want to explain a lot about the table browser, because for me that's one of the most sort of useful tools or features in, in the genome browser once you start doing genomic things. Basically all the data that you ever look at visually in that browser window is all based on coordinates and you can view and download all those coordinates. So any track that you ever see in the genome browser is an underlying table, uh, usually a big kind of MySQL database table that you can download and start playing with. Um, and once we start talking about Galaxy this afternoon, you can start to see that downloading things from the table browser, putting them in Galaxy, a few points and click of the mouse, you can start to answer some of those questions that I put up at the beginning. So we'll go into a table browser, how you can do filtering, um, intersections, how you can upload your own data as custom tracks. That can be a really cool feature because those that get th any data you upload is created as own track and you can then start intersecting that and filtering it with existing tracks. So you may have a set of regions, like a set of genes you're interested in, and you want to say, oh, you know, okay, which ones of my genes that are highly expressed in some brain region intersect with things that are conserved across species or overlap something, and there you go. You can do it in two minutes. And then we'll do a few more exercises as well at the end and just questions. Okay. 
So if you want to get to the table browser, again, they may have just changed this recently. Sorry, these slides are slightly old. It may be under tools now, I think, but basically it's called the table browser or tables. And as I said, the genome, UCSC genome browser is essentially a giant database. It enables you to view things in a visual format that we can easily understand and make sense of, but in reality, this is the underlying data. So these giant tables of probably too small for anyone to read, but lots of numbers, basically. So there are primary tables, and then those are linked to secondary tables that link, you know, gene IDs or things between different builds or between different genomes, all wrapped up in a giant MySQL database that's sitting uh, in Santa Cruz in California. And when you're querying it, it's basically going to this underlying database and spitting out the data in a nice visual format for you to look at. But like I say, what's really powerful is not just being able to view stuff, that's nice, but actually being able to go back and download some of these tables that you're interested in and extract the information from those tables and start playing with it. So then you can start to do genome-wide analysis and answer some really fundamental questions all on your own. There's a paper here if anyone wants to look at that just describes the table browser tool. So let's start digging into this. And what we're going to do here is go through a couple of specific exercises that will illustrate the functionality of the table browser and also show you how you can start to get answers to some biological questions in pretty rapid time. So this is just a table taken from this publication here that was a review of known uh, trinucleotide repeat expansion disorders in humans. So anyone that is familiar with human genetic diseases, some of these things may be familiar. Huntington's disease, spinocerebellar ataxias, spinal bulbary muscular atrophy, myotonic dystrophy, fragile X, things like that. These are all disorders caused by triplet repeats that expand to unusually large sizes, often associated with um, neurological disease. So we're going to start to use the table browser to show you how quickly you can go from the human genome to getting some of these causative triplet repeats. So if we take this table, one thing that's clear is that CAG, so a trinucleotide CAG repeated multiple times in a row, is a common motif that's associated with quite a few of these different triplet repeat disorders. So we're going to take that idea and start to ask, okay, what genes in the human genome have a CAG repeat within them? Because we know about a bunch of triplet repeat disorders caused by expanded CAGs. Maybe there are other ones. Reasonable question to ask. So we open up our table browser. And again, I don't know if people want to try and do this at the same time or follow along, and we can stop at any point and just stick up a hand. <coughs> So if you go into the table browser, you get a page that looks like this. So some of this will be quite familiar, what we looked at before. We can choose our organism, uh, or sorry, our clade, our organism, which assembly, again, very important, which assembly of that, that organism we want to look at. And then this row here is basically selecting all those different tracks that we had underneath. So, for example, here, the gene and gene predictions, that's where all the gene annotations are. And we, you know, here it's got UCSC genes, so that particular gene annotation track within the larger gene annotations. So what we want to do, our question, our biological thing that we're starting out with, is ask the question, well, where are there, first of all, <coughs> triplet repeats comprised of a CAG motif in the human genome? And then we're going to ask which ones of those are located within coding regions of genes. Okay, and we can do that really easily in the table browser. So we choose our genome. Obviously, we want mammal, we want human. We're going to do this in HG19, but we could equally do it in any other build. Depends, you know, what other data you may want to incorporate. And I say we're searching for simple repeats with a CAG motif. And the way that we do that is by choosing here the group. So you first kind of need to be a little bit familiar with where the data that you're looking for is. So, you know, previously when we were looking at that page of the UCSC Genome Browser View, you had all the tracks underneath. They were sorted into sort of families, yeah? So it was like genes and gene predictions, mapping and sequencing, um, regulation, variation repeats. We're looking for triplet repeats. So that's going to be, in, I know, in the variation repeats family. If you don't know that, you might be digging around <laughs> for a long time. Sometimes you need to have two windows open at the same time and figure out where it is. So we choose the variation repeats group. 
Um, and then we don't want common snips, we want simple repeats. So these are all the different tracks that are in the variation and repeats group that we could have chosen, but we want this one because we're looking at simple repeats, tandem repeats. I usually don't change that option, but I think you can. Da -da -da. And there are various things, so we could also choose a custom track if we'd uploaded something. And if you click on this button here, now that we've selected the simple repeats track, this is just a description of all the underlying information that's contained within that simple repeats track. So obviously there is the coordinates of the chromosome, the start and the end. PRF is the name of the algorithm, tandem repeats binder that annotates all these simple repeats in the genome. This particular one, this is just an example, is a six base pair repeat with 77 copies. So a sigma repeated 77 times and lots of other things about that, the proportion of different bases, the actual sequence of that motif. So this is all the information for any one entry in this table that is there. Okay, we want to search in the whole human genome in this particular example. So on this line here, we have choices of saying, do we want to search the whole genome? Um, this is a historical artifact, so I'm going to encode pilot regions, not really relevant anymore. More relevant would be, do we want to look in a specific position? So we could say, all right, we want to download data for the entire genome, or we just want to search on, say, chromosome 21. Or if we were looking at TP53, you said what triplet repeats are in TP53, you could have the coordinate there. The nice thing about this, if you were just looking at a region in the browser visually, and then you go to the table browser, it's instantly going to have an insert piece of DNA you were just looking at. It's not like you need to remember it and type it in. It's right there. So in this case, we're going to choose the whole genome because we want triplet repeats in the entire genome. I just explained about that. Or you can define multiple regions. So if it's just a, a set of 10 different regions and different chromosomes, you can type them in or upload a table. And you can click on, for example, once you've entered your query of like all the simple repeats in the entire human genome of HG19 build, if you click on this button here, what it's going to do is say, this is what you're going to be downloading or what I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you 962,000 entries. That's the number of tandem repeats annotated in the human genome, covering 73 megs. That's about 2.5% of the genome. The smallest one is a, actually, I'm not quite sure what that is. But anyway, it gives you a whole bunch of summary statistics, okay? So it's like, you know, do you really want to download nearly a million things? Well, actually, yeah, we do. Okay, and then we didn't just want every triple repeat. That was for all triple repeats. We only wanted ones with the sequence CAG. So that's going to be a small subset of them. And so to do that, you have these other options here. And we basically want to apply a filter. Like I said, we don't want them all. We just want the ones with the CAG motif. So you hit filter or create on the filter button. It'll bring up this uh, page here. And you have many different options of, okay, what do you want to filter? Do we want only a certain chromosome or with only a certain range of coordinates or you know, only a certain copy number or whatever, only a certain fraction of different bases, blah, blah, blah. Basically, any of the uh, you know, annotations of that repeat, you can filter on it. And we basically only want the ones that have CAG, so we just type CAG, hit Submit. And so now it's saying, because a little edit button appears, that's just a cue to say, yeah, you've applied a filter. Sometimes when you have a filter uh, applied, you've set up, it will remember that. So when you come to do another search later on, that filter might still be there, just an FYI. So if you ever see edit button there, that's just a little indicator that you've applied a filter. It remembers that. And we can do other things. We can do intersections. We can have two different tracks and say, only tell me the repeats that occur in some subset of the genome. And then down here is our output format. So you're basically saying, this is what I want you to give me. This table, this selection here, I don't know what's going on, there we go. There are many different options. You can basically say, yeah, give me all the data you have. I only want certain fields. Actually, I don't want the, you know, the underlying chromosome start stop. I want the sequence, so give me the CAGs that are each one of those repeats. Give me just the bed, so the chromosome start stop, or make me a custom track of that that I can explore or do something else with. Lots of, or give me a list of all the hyperlinks that I can then click on and it will take me straight to where that is in the genome. So if you say I want all fields from selected tables, it's going to give you this. Sometimes that's not the most useful. For example, this track has this bin number. It's some internal indexing thing. 
for normal humans that is meaningless. What is useful is the chromosome, the start, the stop. For us, we're interested in only the ones with CAG, maybe not these ones, so that's important for us too. And if you wanted, you could just say, yeah, I just want chromosome start, stop, and maybe you know the motif. You could just download those and get rid of all the other bytes that you don't care about. Or like I say, we could just download the sequence, and then it's going to give us this faster format, where it's going to have the coordinate, and then that's the individual sequences of those repeats. Maybe that's useful for you if you want to design primers or something. Or other formats, um, that's a different format, gene transfer format, a custom track that you could then display, or like I said, a hyperlink. So now it will download for each individual repeat, it will give you a hyperlink that you can click on and go to where that is in the genome browser. And then you choose, do you want that to display in the browser window? Bear in mind, we just said we want to download a million lines, that's going to take a little bit to display all that in your browser, it will be downloading for a couple of minutes might not want to do that. In which case, rather than leaving this blank, you might put an entry in here and say, okay, I want to download it as a text file and call it, you know, simple repeats, whole genome, HG19 or something. But because we put a filter here where we said we only want CAGs, if we now click on summary statistics, rather than being nearly a million, it's saying, oh, there's only 80, actually. So CAG repeats are actually not very common in the genome. And so if we now hit get output, it's going to tell us all the CAGs in the genome, the triplet repeats, and here's all their coordinates. So uh, it took a while explaining that, but in reality, within 30 seconds, you could download every single CAG triplet repeat in the genome. And there they are. But our question was not just where are all the CAG repeats, it was where are all the CAG repeats that occur within genes. So this is where you can apply other things, these intersections. So this is back where we just were, variation repeats, simple repeats. And we'd apply the filter to only get the CAGs. But now we only want the triplet CAG triplet repeats that occur within genes. So we can use this intersection tool, create a new one. When you click on there, it says, OK, you want to download CAG repeats in the whole genome, and you only want CAG repeats in the genome that intersect with something else. And that's where you tell it what something else that is. And here we just select genes and gene predictions, and we're going to download all the CAG repeats that intersect with UCSC genes, i.e. within genetic regions as defined by that track. And then you have options, so it says, do you want simple repeats that overlap any gene? The inverse, I only tell me repeats that don't overlap with those genes, so you could exclude any repeats that overlap genes. And you can give it criteria, so you can say, well, they have to overlap, and at least 80% of the repeat has to overlap the gene, or 50%, or 10%, or whatever you want. You can just hit submit when you've entered the things you want, and we're basically getting any simple CAG repeat that overlaps with any UCSC gene. And so it now says, now you have an intersection. So again, those things get remembered. And now if we hit summary statistics, we have 80 different entries. I'm sorry, is that right? Yeah, sorry, we had 80 entries before, and now with the intersection, now we have 29. So it's basically saying of the 80 CAG repeats in the genome, 29 overlap genes. That's actually about what you'd expect. Genes, if you add together all the introns and exons, are about a third of the genome. But it's a pretty small number. And we could say, okay, hyperlinks, let's get those, get our output, there they are. So now we could just have a list of these are all the pan repeats located within genes, could be exon, could be intron, and we can just click on any one of those. And if you know anything about our triplet repeat disorders, this one here corresponds to the Huntington protein, so that's the one that expands in Huntington's disease. This is ataxin 1, causes a type of spina cerebellar ataxia. And so if we hit that, it brings up, here is the repeat that we're interested in. You can see the individual basis, the CAGs. Because we zoomed in very closely on the UCSC gene track, you can actually see the amino acids that are encoded by that, and it's a polyglutamine, Q is uh, glutamine. So basically this is a coding CAG triplet repeat mm. that is within the Huntington's gene and encodes a polyglutamine track. And I'll say that's exactly the triplet repeat that expands in Huntington's disease. 
same here for <coughs> ataxin 1, another polyglutamine coding repeat. And then down here at the bottom, we have another one. This is in the um, uh, gene that uh, causes myotonic dystrophy, DMTK. This one, when we look, is not within a coding, a protein coding region. You see it's a thin bar, not a thick bar. This is in an untranslated region of DMTK. Uh, oh, sorry, or an intron, is that right? And yes, when we go back to our summary table, this is exactly what it is. So. And I think the reason why it's, again, this is a just another little foible of working with the genome. This one in this table is listed as a CTG expansion, but the reverse complement of that is CAG. So you can just get little weird things like that of, yeah, we're not, we don't have information on here which way it's transcribed, but it's probably transcribed on the reverse then. So anyway, that was just an example just to show you how Again, with like half a dozen clicks of the mouse, you can go from a biological hypothesis or something to extracting that data. And there we just pulled out three genes that are known to be associated with triplet repeat disorders. Maybe some of these other ones also expand in some triplet repeat disorders. You know, if you wanted to go hunting for more, that would be a really good place to start. One of the other really nice features about the UCSC Genome Browser is the fact that you can upload your own data. So it's not limited to the data you see. Anything you have that's intervals, quantitative data, you know, it could be expression levels for genes or you know, enrichment for something at different regions, you can upload that as a custom track. And that can become very powerful because once it's in the UCSC Genome Browser as a custom track, you can then, all the things I just showed you, it becomes a table that you can intersect, that you can filter with other stuff. So say you have data you know, of, say, genes highly expressed in the nervous system, you could then intersect it with those triple repeat disorders and maybe say, oh, you know, this is a way of subfiltering things down to something I could be more interested in, or whatever your question is. So as I said, if we were just on that page earlier where we're going to extract CAG repeats within genes, instead of getting you know, the hyperlinks that we just showed you, we could download them as a custom track. In this case, we're not you know, uploading our own data, but it's a way of creating a custom track. Hit get output, you get this. You can say, do I want to add any extra base? Do I want to do some funky coloring or something? You can give it a name. That will be the name of your custom track. You can change the way it's going to be displayed. Download it or upload it. And it would then be displayed here. So we now have a new track in the genome that's exactly the query we just, we just made. CAG, triplet repeats, located within genes, and it's now right there. So again, we're seeing the polyglutamine track and the Huntington protein right here. But the other 28 uh, ones we had will be in that same track. And I say, they're, all cr they're now created just like any other track, so they're clickable and it will tell you the coordinates and you know all the features. You could get the DNA of those just the same. Okay, blah, 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 blah. That's just showing, yes, we found Huntington's. And I say, once those custom tracks are there, they're also fully available for all these filterings and intersections. So your own data you can upload. Okay, so let's say you have your own data. You've run, let's say, an RNA sequencing experiment or something, and you now have expression levels for you know 20,000 human genes. You want to upload that and start doing some intersections. That's actually pretty easy to do. So you can go to the custom track, I'm not sure if it's still in the same place on the side or it may be under tools now, so I need to update these slides. There's a whole bunch of help information if you ever get stuck, which will give you all the different options that you can use for custom tracks. But basically, if you go onto that help page, it will tell you the, the fundamentals of setting up a custom track. You basically have to get your data in the right format. You have to tell the genome browser how it's um, going to display that custom track and then upload it and it's available for viewing. Okay, so let's say you have your data. This is how you would go about making it as a custom track. So I already mentioned this phrase here, bed format. That's the most basic format of genomic data that you would use in, for example, the UCSC Genome Browser. There are various different data formats used. I also mentioned wiggle format, it's short, shortened here to WIG. That's where you maybe have quantitative data that per base it can display a quantitative value, you know, kind of a, a bar graph. Bed format just displays coordinates of like yes, no, 
there is or is not something there, i.e. a snip or a repeat or something. And then there's some of these other formats that are less commonly used or maybe more efficient in terms of space. You know, if you have a ton of data, like annotation for every single base in the genome, that's going to be three billion rows of a file. Some of these formats are more efficient ways of, of displaying that. But bed format is the most basic format of data. It's the most commonly used. A bed format file basically consists of a minimum of three fields. First of which is chromosome, second of which is the start coordinate, the third of which is the end coordinate. So say we had, you know, a repeat, you know, that's where it starts, that that's where it ends, that's on the chromosome it's on. Bed format files are usually tab delimited, so each column is separated by a tab. You can just make this in Excel or something, save it as a .txt file, and that's ready to upload as a as a custom track. So chromosome start end. In addition to these three required fields, chromosome start stop, bed form format files can have up to nine other columns of data. Y you could just leave it as these first three columns and that's fine. Or you can add on other annotations. It could be like a name. It could be some value, whatever that is. Here also adding on strand. So is that on the forward strand or the reverse strand? You know, it can be anything you want, basically. And you can add other things that will, the genome browser, this is if you're getting more fancy, will then color it in a different way or make it a thick or a thin line or whatever. A custom track basically looks like this. There is a format you can just download from the, the custom track site that will basically have things, and you can just then modify your data at the bottom. These are just all the header rows that many of them are optional. You know, it's, for example, giving the genome browser how it's going to display that. It's going to pack this other row. It's going to display known genes in the full mode. You can completely delete these. You don't have to have them in there. It's, this is saying how many pixels the image width is going to be. Again, you can delete that. You really just need, um, I think, the track name row here and then your data underneath. So this is a kind of a fancy version. So yeah, you really just need that and then your data at the bottom. So, sorry. Da, 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 da. So, yeah, so if you want to upload a custom track, you have this button here, manage custom tracks. Um, like I say, I think on the new gateway they have, once you actually go in and have the genome browser view, it should be there. I don't know if you guys can see it. Or so, when you open that, this is the, the window you'll get. And you can either just upload a file you've already made, like I say, a tab delimited text file, or you can paste the data in here. So, like I say, normally it would literally just be a track name where you're saying, hey, here's the name of my track, it's whatever genes I like. Um, and you just, you could use these as default colors and then you add in your bed format data. So obviously you have to say, tell it which organism, which genome, which build you're gonna be working in. There's help files here that tell you the different formats and how they work. Let's say you can upload a file from your local computer hard drive, or you can just paste stuff in yourself. So if you just want to paste it in, that would be it right there. And then you just hit submit. And then what will happen is it will take you to the page where your custom track is now shown. So here what we uploaded was four different intervals. As I say, the, the example there was a fancy one where it was coloring them in different ways, black versus gray, because we added in a strand as one of the columns. You can see there are arrows on here showing some on the forward, some on the reverse. And it's also because in addition to the chromosome start stop, we also gave the names of one of the columns. It's added those on as names appearing on the left. So it looks just like any regular track already in the browser. So this is a fancy version. A more simple one would just be a single line with, you know, four intervals or whatever without coloring, without uh, a strand or anything. And I say that example that I just showed you there had other fancy stuff. It was uh, um, uh, saying how some of the other tracks in the browser were going to be displayed. But again, you do not need that. And so once you have a custom track uploaded, it's shown here, a new bar will appear. So your new group of custom tracks where, again, you can change the display just like any of the other uh, pre-existing tracks that are there in the browser. And it also appears in the table browser. So one of the really cool functions is, is once you've uploaded your own data, you can then do intersections with other data that's in the genome browser. 
um, filter it so you could say, well, I know I have these regions I'm interested in. I want to know, you know, non-coding SNPs that overlap those or something. And three or four clicks of the mouse and you have that suddenly. In addition to all those other tracks that I showed you that are pop up by default in the genome browser, there's actually a ton of other information that's there that's not immediately shown to you. So there are a lot of groups, you know, working around the world doing genomics that have created lots of different data sets or analyzed lots of different data sets, so ENCODE, the NIH um, Roadmap, Epigenomics Consortium, people that have published their own data and make it publicly available. And a lot of the time, um, they will send data to the UCSC Genome Browser group and they will not have it as a sort of um, official public track, but it's their data that you can access and there's a ton of that data there. And these are accessible in this little button here called Track Hubs, which is weirdly named. It's not very self-explanatory. I only found out about this a couple of years ago. But basically, if you click on this Track Hubs button here, what it will bring up are all of these other data sets that other researchers have produced and uh, kind of given to the UCSC Genome Browser Group. I think these are ones that are maybe not sort of archived or quality control in quite the same way as the sort of official public tracks that they list normally. But there is a ton of stuff here. You can't read these very well. Yeah, they, they keep changing things. I need to update these slides a bit. I apologize. So this, the, this particular, um, the, you know, the, 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 this particular one they changed dramatically. So it's just ones they said are supposed to. And if you go in, if you go in to look, you know. It's on the My Data on the right-hand side? Once you go in, yeah, so if you go into the genome and you okay. look at the OB1, then there's a My Data tab now, and that's where the, the track comes in. Okay, sorry. I need to update my slides. Sorry. <laughs> But yeah, there's, there's a ton of data here. So for example, just one of these, uh, there's a whole list of probably like 20 or 30 of these different track hubs, other people's data sets. Um, there's one called DNA methylation, which has, for example, whole genome bisulfite sequence data from the uh, NIH Epigenomics Roadmap Project, some other individuals' data sets of like embryonic stem cells, different organisms, different tissues. So you'll find there are dozens and dozens of tracks of methylation profiles right there which, you know, all come from individual publications, but you don't need to download it or make it. It's sitting right there. You just need to go here, click that box, and suddenly it will pop up to you. And so you simply just click on one of those. You say, hey, I want this data. And for now, it, and suddenly it will appear as a new track available for you to see and interact with just like any of the other tracks. So suddenly now you can see, like I say, this is whole genome by sulfite sequencing from iPS cells, neutrophils, spleen, sperm, I think that was generated by different people. So if you're interested in that stuff, it's right there. And again, you can download it. So this is a WIG track, it's quantitative data. So you can see here, for example, here's a region of hypomethylation in sperm. You, know, you can download all that data, intersect it with the table browser, do all kinds of stuff. And again, they're all exactly the same clickable links. You can click on these and there'll be an explanation of this is the data with a reference. This is what was done. Sometimes there's the raw data. Sometimes there's analyzed versions of data. So for example, some of these, it will show you regions of allele-specific methylation or you know, other things like that derived from these data sets where people have done some analysis and also created that as a custom track. And then again, like I say, they're there exactly for intersecting with any other features you want. So you could, again, ask those kind of bioinformatic questions of, you know, let me take other people's whole genome by sulfide sequencing data and then start intersecting and saying, you know, where are the regions where the methylation is, you know, low, high, whatever, that intersects with some gene that I might be interested in. I feel like I went through a lot of that really fast. I apologize. Probably confused everybody. But yeah, so basically, just to sort of summarize, the table browser is a really amazingly powerful tool where any of the data that you can see here you know, visually in the, in the Genome Browser, you can download to your own computer. Within the Genome Browser itself, you can start doing filters, intersections. And particularly when you start combining that with your own data as custom tracks and uploading that, you can then interact with these different things. You can start to, without knowing any bioinformatics, start to ask some sort of genomic style questions uh, and do some pretty cool things. A lot of it's, I think, just getting used to 
all of the data that's there. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different data sets knowing what they are. Sometimes I'll just sit there and you know scroll through, oh, what's new on Track Hub since I last checked it out? And like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Somebody's posted you know, <laughs> 100 new data sets of something I'm interested in. And it's there to download. The UCSC Genome Browser also has, obviously, has its main hub site, the, the website I that you've been looking at, but there are a variety of different other um, mirrors. So it's basically sort of open source software. Anyone in academia can download the UCSC Genome Browser, all the underlying tables, all the source code. You could set it up on your own server in your lab if you wanted to. The lab I used to work in did that. We had our own custom in-house browser where we basically put all of our data that we generated into the lab as custom tracks on our own personal browser. Other people have made browsers for a variety of other organisms that have other things in. Occasionally, the UCSC Genome Browser breaks and isn't working for a day. Sometimes then I'll just find some other mirror site that is working better and you know you have a backup. They usually have all the same functionality as the, the original UCSC one. But yeah, you know, there are uh, individuals set up their own version of the browser, their own instance uh, in their own labs, and you too can do the same thing if you want. All right, and If anyone is still following, <laughs> there are some more um, exercises here based on using the table browser and sort of custom tracks to start asking some slightly more advanced questions like, you know, obtaining filtered list of SNPs, genes, whatever that intersect with other features in the genome. So people want to have a crack at some of those right now. These are more simple versions of what we'll try doing this afternoon once I explain Galaxy a bit to you and what you can do with that. So I'd recommend having a go at some of these and Felix and Mafalda and I can kind of wander around and hopefully help you guys out. Okay. <laughs> what we're going to do this afternoon is talk about this other tool. It's called the Galaxy Toolkit. Anybody here used it before? One person, a little bit, two people. So this is another completely free, publicly available graphical interface you access, you know, online. It's different to the UCSC Genome Browser in that it inherently contains zero data. Okay, it's simply a set of um, pre-made tools that enable you to do a lot of um, sort of standard bioinformatics tasks through a simple point-and-click GUI interface. It's integrated very heavily with the UCSC Genome Browser, so it's very easy, as I'll show you, to import data from the Genome Browser. Exactly the same interface as we went through with the Table Browser function. There's a single button, and you're right there, and then it takes it straight into Galaxy. And it's also very easy to upload your own data. And I'll show you some of the tools and functionality. We'll kind of start with a basic walkthrough of you know, how it works, what it can do. Um, delve into some of the tools, and again, it's, it's kind of like the, the Genome Browser in that once you get to know what's there in the Genome Browser, that's in you know, different data sets, and this is terms of the different tools and how you can link them together to start um, very rapidly doing what seem on the surface like complex bioinformatic tasks, literally with like, you know, five minutes or less with a few clicks of the mouse. Um, so like I say, if anyone's scared of programming or anything, it's a really great kind of way because you don't have to do any coding at all, it's all just, you know, mouse driven, but it can do a lot of complex tasks. And even if you are good at coding, writing your own scripts, there's still a lot of things in here that are really great tools that make your life a lot easier. And what I want to do is, do, like I say, give you guys a bit of a flavor. And then I put up a few problems that are on the, um, the Blackboard site. So there's four sort of different questions. They're all just general, hey, let's analyze the genome and get an answer. Um, but the, uh, basically the methods are just to kind of show you that once you know what things are there with those, those simple tasks, you can generate some sort of biological insights and you can apply those things to your data and stuff. Okay, so we'll go over an introduction, talk about the interface, just the basic setup of the website and, and you know, how you interact with it, how you would go about importing data into the Galaxy Toolkit. Like I say, it's a blank canvas. And you, before you can do anything, you need to bring in data, either your own from your, you know, your own computer or from other public data sets like the UCSC Genome Browser. Some of the tools in there that you can use to start preparing data. 
um, analyzing data, and then kind of just do a brief summary, and then go on to some of these exercises. If you start by going, uh, people on the Galaxy website right now, if you go there, this is just a screenshot from the, the, the Galaxy homepage. If you were to, um, one of the most common ways you would might want to go about importing data into Galaxy to start operating on it within the Galaxy framework is through the UCSC uh, table browser. And so basically, there is a, a toolbar on the left-hand side of, of the Galaxy homepage, um, which enables you to do lots of these things. It's kind of grouped like the UCSC Genome Browser. And there's one of these headings, which contains within it usually multiple individual tasks that you could do. And so the top two ones under Get Data here is you can either upload a file from your own computer or import something from the UCSC Genome Browser. And if you were to click on simply UCSC Table Browser, it opens up instantly within the Galaxy window the table browser from UCSC. And everything there is exactly the same, and it will automatically have this little box, hit, box ticked here, send output to Galaxy. So you would just go through exactly the same functions that we showed earlier, hit get output, and suddenly your data will be there imported into Galaxy. OK, so this is basically the, the home landing page for Galaxy. And you have a get data function up here. You can either upload files from your computer, or you have the import data from the table browser, where it will instantly open this. And um, we can do that right now. It's just a quick example. This is just what opened up. I guess the defaults from there before. HG19, UCSC genes. I've highlighted this position just to make it faster. We're going to get it in. Let's do all fields. It's going to import it into Galaxy, and we just hit go. It then brings you back to your Galaxy interface that we were just looking at. And up here, you can see there is now on our history bar over on the right hand side. So the, the way it's orientated, there are tools here on the left. The middle bit is your viewing window where you can look at data that you may have imported. And over here on the right, this is your, your sort of history bar which shows all of the tasks that you've performed within Galaxy. So if you upload or import data, it will appear here. If we then do a second function, it will appear as task number two above that. If we start doing things in here, I may actually switch to a mirror site, one that's so Galaxy is now often pretty heavily used by people. You'll just notice this now just changed to green. So while I was talking there for the last minute, it was churning on that. And even though the data that we imported was pretty small, or we'll hit the eyeball, it just imported four lines of data. That took a long time. So a lot of people are using this to do now. You can see next generation sequence analysis. You can analyze RNA-seq data here, SNP calling, all kinds of stuff. So people are doing some pretty heavy lifting. It's all run on servers, mostly in Pennsylvania somewhere, I think. So sometimes it can get a bit backlogged. Basically, any things you do will get put in the queue. And if somebody else is doing, or hundreds of other people are doing lots of other analysis, that can take a while. So one alternative I often use is uh, the genomic hyper browser. So just like UCSC Genome Browser, uh, <coughs> the source code is all freely available. You could download an instance of Galaxy and install it on your own servers if you wanted to. Various other groups have done this and made their servers publicly available as well. They're not so well known about. This is one that's hosted in Norway. It basically has all the functionality of the one we are looking at. It's actually got some other stuff added in for doing um, things like permutation, Monte Carlo analysis. But because not many people use it, it's often really fast. You'll just do something here, and it will be done instantly, whereas sometimes with the, the master site for the Galaxy, you could be waiting five minutes for it to do simple things. So let's just try. Let's do get data again here. So same thing brought up. This is going to be a slightly bigger region. Let's make it comparable. There we go. It's a different chromosomal region, but hopefully that will work a lot faster. So it's already chewing on it straight away. And it's done. So yeah, that was about 10 times faster than using the Galaxy homepage. So now I've told everybody about it, you'll probably use this and it will slow down. So. But there are various other mirrors of the Galaxy server around as well that you can use. So yeah, so as I kind of already explained, there is the toolbar on the left where you can upload data and start executing commands on that. The middle section is your kind of viewing panel where you can look at things you may have uploaded or see the output of a, a command you've performed. And the panel on the right, your history, once you start 
doing multiple things will stack up. If you have some long histories, there can be hundreds of items in there. It gets confusing. But that's the basic layout of the page. So this is the home page where you land. Again, what's nice about Galaxy is it has lots of different um, built-in tutorials. So if you click on here, there are lots of animated and voiced over kind of walkthrough sessions of how to do simple tasks that you might want to perform. So if you're kind of a novice, that's a good place to start. Just you know, let somebody lead you through it. Starting out the very basic things to doing some of the more sort of complicated tasks you might want to do. And yeah, if you want to start downloading your own instance of Galaxy, that's obviously if you're a little more of an advanced user. Blah, 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 let's go through that. There's also wiki pages, again, telling you all kinds of stuff when they're doing updates. Again, they're always adding in new tools, things like that, so it's changing a lot. If you are starting up as a new user on Galaxy or the Genomic Hyper Browser or any other instance, something I think is a really useful thing to do is create a uh, user account for yourself, because when you do that, it will remember your history. So if you do a bunch of work today and then in six months' time, you want to go back and say, oh, I already downloaded those things, did that, I want to go back and you know, modify, add in a different list, apply a different filter. If you create a user account up here, so you register, enter in your email address, create a password, and it'll send you a, a link to log in. Um, anything you do in Galaxy will be remembered. There is some limit on your memory. There's a little counter up here. Right now there's nothing uploaded, so it says 0%. Once you start uploading, if you work with really big data sets like next-gen sequencing and stuff, you can start using up that quota. I mean, I've been using Galaxy for 10 years, and I don't think I've ever used my quota because I'm not doing next-gen stuff on there. But even so, I've still probably got you know, gigabytes of data on my account, and it's fine. And this is all basically done. This is just an interface that you know, it's not actually importing it into your browser. It's uploading it into some server in Pennsylvania, and all the operations are being done, and it just spits out the answers to you here, and you can you know, interface it. You can also create multiple different histories. So if you have an account, you know, you may have five different projects you're working on and you want to create one particular instance for project one, a different one for project two, maybe you're working in different organisms, different builds, things like that. As I explained, if you want to get data, one of the most common things you want to do is UCSC table browser brings you up to this. And then once you successfully choose the files you want, hit get output, it'll bring up this to say, okay, you successfully added that to the queue. That will then appear on the right-hand side as your next item in your history. And if it's put in the queue but not being operated on, this will be colored gray. If it's then being operated on, some functions you may do may take a while, you know, half an hour or something for a, a, a bigger job. It'll be yellow with a little, you know, radar going around to show you it's being worked on. And once that job is finished and it's available to be viewed or looked at, it'll turn green. This is also interactive. So if you have an item here on the right, in a collapse view, it looks like that, so it's not taking up too much space. You just get the title of what that is. So it's saying, we imported something from UCSC, the human genome, and it was the known gene track with uh, things in that um, coordinate range. So if you click on it, it'll then expand and give you a lot more details of what is actually in that item. So it'll say, OK, you downloaded 929 things. In this case, we know it's genes. Um, it tells you the format. It's a bed format file, so it has that chromosome start stop, maybe some other information. It's in HG19, and it gives you just a quick preview window just showing you the first few rows and columns there just so you get a quick glimpse. You can also, from this, save it. So if you've put it on into Galaxy, maybe you've done some functions on there that I'll show you in a minute, and you want to download it locally to your computer, you just click on the disk icon, and you can save it directly to your hard drive. Um, you can also look up information. If you want to view the complete data set, up in the top right is this eye icon. So if we click on that, you'll then see the full, or at least the number of rows and columns you can see, shown in the, the viewing panel in the center there. So this is the data track we actually downloaded. It's that gene bed format file from UCSC Genome Browser. If you want to edit things, to so say you don't like this name, it's sometimes they're a little bit cryptic, the names that Galaxy automatically gives them when you download stuff or do an operation, you can change that. So you click on the little pencil icon if you want to. It'll then bring up the attributes, so either names and things for, for this table, and you can call it whatever you want. So say you, know, you want to call it analysis number one with a time or something, because often you'll go through multiple iterations and get lost, or call it something more specific that means something more to you. Um, that's where you can do it. Or if you import some data set and you realize you screwed up, you did the wrong thing, or accidentally uploaded something from the wrong build of the genome, I really don't want that, you can just delete it. 
That happens a lot too. Um, or sometimes you'll do some operation and realize you did completely the wrong thing and there's some redundant analysis sitting there. Often it's good just to clean it up. Just to note, it doesn't actually delete it. It just removes it from your, your viewing panel. So it's still there if you wanted to dig in and go back to it. So that was just a kind of brief overview of you know, how you just navigate around Galaxy. So let's pretend we're actually going to do some real analysis. As I say, Galaxy, when you start out, is completely blank. If you're doing a fresh history, there's nothing there. It's just a set of tools saying, let's do some stuff. So the first thing is you need to do is get data. You can import data from many different sources. I say I usually just use the UCSC table browser, but if you're working on other organisms, there's all these other servers, you know, for yeast, rat, fly, etc. They're all similarly linked. Or, as I say, you can upload a file from your computer if it's formatted in the correct way. Or you can, you can upload pretty much anything you want. You could import a list of telephone numbers if you want and start doing things on that. But, um, you'd have to hack the tools a bit to make it work, but sometimes that's actually really useful. OK, so sorry, I feel like we're going around in circles here. So OK, so what we're going to do is download, um, again, always make sure you've got the right build. Galaxy has a nice inbuilt filter uh, feature in that any data file you upload into it, whether it's from another server, like UCSC Genome Browser, or from your own data, it forces any file to have a genome you know, organism and assembly number attached to it, and it won't let you do for example, an intersection of a data set that's in HG18 and intersect it with HG19, it would just say, uh, it doesn't even show you that as an option. So sometimes if you're doing things, you're like, why is my data file not here, not here in the list of my drop downs of things I can intersect with? Sometimes because you screwed up and imported things in a different build and Galaxy's saying, hey, you don't want to do that. So here, again, we go through, choose our data, Again, you could import data from the whole genome or a certain position, whatever you want. You can choose the data format, and this is actually quite important here because usually you want to import data in a format that is ready to be analyzed by Galaxy. So what I mean by that is, um, I don't know if you remember, for example, when we were looking at the, the, the simple repeats file earlier. If you notice, if we said, going back to the other talk, if we said import all data <laughs> Uh, of that file, the first column was some random bin number. I don't know if you remember me saying that's just some ID they used to tag something in, in, you know, in their internal system. Galaxy will look at that and go, I have no idea what column one is. It's some random thing called bin. Like, and it probably won't let you then do an intersection of that because it's expecting for column number one to be chromosome because it's usually expecting data in a bed or similar format. So this is um, often quite important just to Avoid giving yourself headaches, having to do extra operations on a file. Um, usually bed format's good as a, a file format to import data in, but not always. It depends on the track type. Um, just kind of takes experience to know what works well. And I say, when you do this from Galaxy, this tick mark here is usually already there. If you're actually working in UCSC Genome Browser independently, so you have a different browser window open where you're working in UCSC Genome Browser, I believe that is also there too. So if you can tick that as a in the UCSD genome browser and then import it into Galaxy. I'm not exactly sure on the preferences if it uses the same browser or uses the current login or something. I, I don't remember. But usually it's better just to access it directly through Galaxy. And then you just hit your get output. It'll just say, hey, is that exactly what you want? Do you want to add on anything else? Do some coloring, blah, blah, blah. And you send to Galaxy and up it pops. And in this case, what we've uploaded, UCSC genes located on all of the X chromosome. <coughs> um, if we click on there, that's 2,930 entries. There's actually a lot less genes on the X than that. There's more like 1,000. Many genes have multiple alternative isoforms, so that's why you may be surprised to see, huh, why is the 3,000 genes listed on the X? There's not. It's just each one has a separate entry as a different isoform. Okay. And so what's going to be done here now is uploading <coughs> a second data file. So we went back to UCSC Table Browser. Now it's going to, we've selected something from the regulation track, chosen the DNA's hypersensitive sites. Sometimes these names here, if you're just choosing them in the Table Browser, can be a little bit cryptic. Sometimes you need to cross-reference to the, the UCSC Genome Browser and make sure you've got the right thing. And downloading a specific set of tables from a HapMap cell line 
um, infoblastoid cell line. And so when you hit send to galaxy, this will pop up now as number two on your list. So the original thing, the set of genes we downloaded for the X chromosome is there, stays as item number one. A new item will appear above that, labeled in numerical order. Again, if you click on there, you see now this is about 7,500 regions. As I said, you can also import data from many other places, so microbial data. It interfaces with biomarts. That's a sort of a data repository that's, that's very useful for a lot of sort of bioinformatics-style things. Mod encode projects, that's encode in model organisms, things like Drosophila, C. elegans. And again, every time you upload data, you could, into a single history, upload data from Drosophila, you could upload data from C. elegans, you could upload data from human, but it's never going to allow you to start combining data from different genomes of different organisms and intersecting them, because that makes no sense. Yes, everything will have a coordinate, but a coordinate in yeast is no relation to a coordinate of a gene in human. So, you know, generally it's good to separate your histories of a particular workflow you're doing. If you're operating on one project in one organism, and then you switch to doing something different, it's good if you have your login, create a new history. All your other data from your initial analysis will be there, and this will become blank, history number two. You can say Drosophila, genome project, whatever, and it's create a new thing there, just so you don't mentally mix things together. So you can also, in addition to importing things from another database like the UCSC Genome Browser, the other really nice feature is you can upload your own data. So basically anything you want, you can stick into Galaxy. Often this will be, you know, maybe a custom list of genes you're really interested in, or, you know, data you've downloaded from some paper, the supplementary methods or supplementary uh, materials of that paper that you want to start working on and saying, hey, you know, okay, this group produced this data, how does that fit with my data or with publicly available data, start analyzing it. You know, it can be some array data you may have, you know, data on gene expression or whatever, or SNPs you found. So there you just click on Upload File. Here, it, again, you have to be careful that the data you're uploading, if it's your own, it's not coming from another database like UCSC, is that it's in a format that Galaxy will understand. So again, a safe way there is always bed format. So column one, it should be chromosome. Column two should be the start coordinate. Column three should be the end coordinate in a tab delimited file format. So you can make a file like this in Excel, you know, if you're importing, if you've downloaded some data from somebody's paper, you can have a big Excel file. You always have to just save it as like a .txt, not an Excel file, because Galaxy will go, I don't understand what that is. And then you can have tons of other columns if you wish, you know, gene expression values, whatever they are. So you simply click here, and just like uploading any other file, you locate it on your hard drive. Often, you don't usually need to tell it what file format it is. It's smart enough to know that if you're giving it a bed format file, it can recognize that, or some other file format. And it can take many different formats, all of these, like WIG format, you know, GIF format, faster format, bed format, etc. One thing it did not, okay, I'm surprised on this slide, you will always have to tell it what genome you're uploading. So if you have your own data and it's mouse MM10 assembly, you have to select that. So this is here, a big drop-down box, um, where there will be probably several hundred different genome assemblies listed. Um, so you could just type in MM10 and you'll find it, or HG19 of the human genome or whatever. And then again, you just hit go, and it would appear on the right. Okay, that's the simple part of just getting data into Galaxy. I haven't done anything exciting at all yet. So now we can start using some of the other functionalities that are over here on the left, the different tools that are there. So we're going to start out with this data set of genes and start doing some manipulation on that file that we imported from the UCSC Genome Browser. So there are many different options here. I'll go through some worked examples of these in a minute, but let's just go through these slides that are here. So you can do simple things like manipulating a text. So if you click on this new header here, text, the get data one that we currently have expanded is going to minimize, and this one's going to expand and show all the options under the text manipulation header. So we have, you know, 15 different options of things we can do here. And this is doing basic, you know, cutting out columns, inserting columns, deleting rows, things like that. So if you have a massive table of a million things, you can do it here. Say, delete out column four, you know, insert uh, a new set of rows, with this function or something, pasting in, combining multiple files together, all this stuff you can do with these different commands. So if we want to cut columns, that is, we have a file here that has these various columns, and we want to remove some from it and create a new file of those specific columns. What's really nice is every time for any 
different tool that's pre-built here on the left-hand side. If you click on that, so we just clicked on the, the cut column here, it brings up at the top here, you know, asking you what you want to do, but underneath it gives you a specific explanation of what this command will do, because some of them are not self-explanatory from their name, and usually gives you a specific example. So it says, okay, if this was your input and you gave it this command, this is going to be your output. So again, it's like fully self-explanatory. You can see what each function is doing before you actually execute it. You'll still make mistakes, but you know, it at least helps reduce that a bit. And the commands are very simple. It's basically saying, okay, which columns do you want? Which of the items in your history panel on the right are we going to be operating on? So we're saying we're going to choose item number two. So yeah, so we choose the columns that we want to cut. So we're actually going to be sorry operating on the genes, data set number one. We're going to, here it's columns one, two, three, six, and something else, column four. So what that will do is it will take this input file that we started with, and it's going to create a new file that takes columns one, column two, column three. So that's the chromosome, the start, the stop, so the initial three you know, coordinates. And then it's going to take columns six and four, which is, I'm not, I think that's strand and gene ID or something. So you just enter those in there. You tell it which table we're going to be operating, uh, yeah, which, which item over here we're going to be doing that on, item number one. So you just click on this, it'll give you a drop down of options. Hit execute. And then what's going to happen is it said, okay, job number three has just started. This is what you did. It will appear now here on the right. It might take a few seconds wherever to get going and turn green. And then say, all right, this is the output you just made. There are other items down here, things like filtering and sorting. So again, these are just very basic functions that you could do. So if we chose the filter function, again, it brings up another interface with the example of what that might do if you operated that on a data set. And here we're going to take that file, so a subset of the, the UCSC genes file where we took out the coordinates, the strand, and the gene ID. And now what we're going to do is put in, we're going to require that column four, which is the strand, so we had some genes on the forward strand, some genes on the reverse strand, has to be equal to positive. So in other words, we're going to only retain those genes that are on the positive strand and throw away the ones on the negative. So again, it gives you some different syntax if you scroll down below. But if we enter C4, that means column four of this table equals plus it's going to filter to retain only things that in column four have a plus. If they have something else, they'll be thrown out. You can execute, it creates that file, and there is new file number four. Like I said, sometimes the names are not very useful to you once you've maybe generated 20 or 30 things. You'll go, cut on data one. Like, what was that I was doing? So you kind of often, it's not, that's where it's nice to use this pencil edit command and say, oh, this is where I extracted, you know, chromosome start, stop, strand gene name or something off UCSC genes, HG19. And this is, you could change that to like positive strand genes only or something. And again, once you've got that, if you want to, it's always a good idea to check out whatever you asked the computer to do that it actually did that. Sometimes mistakes get made that it will, sometimes it will throw an error and it will usually tell you, but sometimes weird things happen too. Again, you just click on the eye and now if you look at this, you see we have genes, every single one is positive, and as we did this uh, cut earlier where we said we want chromosome start, stop, strand, and gene ID, that's what we have. So it's good every time you do one of these operations just to take a look at it and say, <coughs> is that what I got? Also looking here where it tells you the number of regions, that's always just a good kind of sanity check. Anything in bioinformatics, it's always good to have an idea of what did I put in, do I have some rough expectation of what might come out? So if my input was 2,930 transcripts on the X, and I filtered for ones on the positive strand only, a reasonable expectation is maybe you should get about half out of what you put in, unless you think there's some consistent strand bias of genes on the X. And it's nice to see that we started out with nearly 3,000, and we got just under 1,500, so that, that smells right. If I did that and got 10 as my output, I'd be like, <coughs> that's weird. Like, why did I lose 97% of my genes? Like, it could be that 97% are on the negative strand, but that seems really unlikely. So that's always a good sanity check in anything you do in sort of bioinformatics. Just have some expectation of what's going in, 
what you think might come out based on what you know about the genome. And again, you may want to change the name of that. It gives you lots of information exactly what was done. Okay, we're sort of whipping through this here. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Some of it may seem a little abstract, but this thing, I find the easiest way is to actually just get your hands dirty and you figure it out. Yeah. Sorry, so when you say project, you mean like a new item number here? Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah, so every time you do anything, upload, do an operation on an existing file, it'll call the output of that as a new number, an ordinal number, so number four, number five, number six, number seven. So yeah, I have some histories going up into the hundreds where you're <laughs> they get big. Um, yeah. Every time, I mean, I don't know exactly what's going on on the back end here. You know, this is all being done on some server somewhere else remotely. This is just an interface to tell the server what to do and look at what it's produced. I believe it's a new file that's created there that you're accessing. Well, it depends what you're working on. If we were just working on something like this where it's sets of coordinates, even if you have files that have hundreds of thousands or even millions of rows, in the world of bioinformatics, that's chump change. What starts to get really memory hungry is next generation sequencing data sets. Uh, you know, if you start having, you know, a few lanes of Illumina high seq paired end, and you know, you're now you're talking like maybe a billion reads that you've got, um, that's when it starts to eat up your memory. I, I've never ever run into any memory issue, and I've been using this for a really long time. And sometimes I just do it on the fly. I just don't bother logging in, and you just do some stuff because you're like, oh, I want to check something else. Done. I wouldn't think of it as a major concern unless you're going to start doing some heavy lifting of next-gen sequencing data. But yeah, like I say, a lot of this probably seems really abstract until you actually start thinking about trying to solve problems using this and understanding what the different tools are, and I'll go over some of that in a minute. Okay. So now we're actually going to do some analysis of data. So we uploaded some, some files from the UCSC Genome Browser. We manipulated one of them by cutting out some columns and sorting and filtering it. We're actually going to do a sort of bioinformatic task now, some, something real. So a simple one would be to say, all right, I have a bunch of genes, and I want to know what's the sequence next door to those genes. You know, maybe you want to say you're making a custom microarray design, and you want to design probes that are in, you know, plus or minus 10 KB of all these genes you're interested in. You might want to use a tool like this to get all those genes, extend the, the sequence, you know, some flanks, and extract that, and maybe do some analysis on it, figure out what it is you're looking at. So we have our list of genes on the X chromosome. We filtered them to be only on the positive strand, so that's about half the genes on the X. And what we're going to do now is find out what the flanking sequence next to all those genes is. So this is one of my sort of favorite, uh, aside from uploading data, this is probably the single sort of category that I use most, the operate on genomic intervals. It's got a lot of really useful tools in there for manipulating sort of genomic data. So again, if you click on the operate on genomic intervals, all the other ones will contract down, and this one will expand out. And you can see we have intersect, subtract. So if we have two different data sets, say genes and repeats, we could say, Tell me all the genes that don't overlap or repeat. We can merge things together. You know, if we have a set of redundant intervals, I was talking earlier with Brian about because of multiple isoforms, if you drew transcription start sites around those, that you may have the same thing represented 10 times. You can merge things down and collapse it to a non-redundant set. You can concatenate data sets. You can calculate how many bases are covered. You can complement things, cluster things, join. That's a really useful one. Get flanks. You know, all these different kind of commands that things you might want to do. So we're going to do this get flanks one. So that's basically saying, does it have it here? OK. So again, there's an example here. If my input was this, let's say this is one of these genes on the X chromosome, the red bar, I'm going to ask it to output for me a sequence that is on, for example, the upstream region of every single gene that I input in my list. 
you know, maybe I want the promoter region of every positive strand gene. I could get it this way, you know, if I just said a promoter is plus uh, 2KB upstream or something of the TSS. So again, you get your table like this, and then you just tell Galaxy, okay, I want to operate on this particular data set over here in my history, data set number four. That's my chromosome X genes filtered for any of those on the positive strand. As I said down here, it tells you exactly what this tool is doing. And then you can specify various parameters that you may want to modify. You can say, I want, for example, here flanks only maybe that are upstream, i.e. they'll have a smaller coordinate. Only them downstream, I'll have a bigger coordinate. And given that we're putting in genes on the positive strand, these are ones that look like this. Anything upstream is going to be, you know, maybe a sort of including a promoter region. Anything downstream is going to be beyond the three prime end of the gene. Or it can be both. And then you can say how much offset and how much flank do I want to report back, for example. So you could just change that and say I want 2KB with a zero offset. So in other words, it's going to start at the start of that gene and it's going to output for me the 2KB right upstream of the gene transcription start site, which you could say is a, not a terrible definition of a vague promoter region. And then you just hit go. It appears as item number five. What's nice to see is you have the exact same number of output regions as you input, so saying it returns something for everything of your input. That's your sanity check that it didn't skip or miss something. Again, you might want to change the name and give it something that's more meaningful for you. And what we're going to do now is join using this other function here. This is where you can take two different data sets. So what we did is we just extracted 2KB from upstream of each of those genes, which you could, like I say, as a rough promoter region. One of the other data sets we downloaded earlier, it's now gone, <coughs> disappeared off the bottom of our history, was DNA's hypersensitivity sites. So those are places in the genome where usually proteins are binding. So, you know, maybe they're identifying regulatory elements. And what it's now going to do, we're going to use this join command. So we had one data set, which is all of our 2KB upstream regions of all our genes. We have another data set. It's a set of intervals that said there's a DNA's hypersensitivity site here and here and here in bed format. And what this is going to do is join them together. So it's going to take data set one, our promoter regions of genes on the X, data set two, our DNA's hypersensitivity sites where proteins are binding, and it's going to report out <coughs> any regions that are common <coughs> to both, i.e. Any, any DNA's hypersensitivity sites that occur in the promoter regions of genes. So we can start to ask some biological questions that might be useful for us. So this is this join command. It's on the same operate on genomic intervals. Again, it's got the explanation down here. And it says, I want to join data set number five. That is our 2KB upstream promoter regions, or our X chromosome genes, with data set number two. That was our DNA's hypersensitivity sites. You can specify how many bases need to overlap for you to say that's a true join. One is the default, i.e. even one base that's common to the two. And then there's various options here of um, exactly what you want to be returned. The default is only, rec only records that are joined together and in a join. I, we, we input 1,492 flanks. I don't remember how many DNA's hypersensitivity sites there are. If we choose this one, it's only going to report the DNA's hypersensitivity sites that do occur within 2KB upstream of the gene, if that makes sense. You can also change this, and it may say report every gene promoter, but it will only join on some gene promoters will have no DNA's hypersensitivity sites, and it will give you the full list back and even tell you which ones do have a site and which ones don't. So here you just hit execute. Again, another, it now appears as a new item in our history. There's the item. It has 947 entries in it. So in other words, we put in nearly 1,500 promoter regions, but only about 2 thirds of those overlap the DNA's hypersensitivity site. And if you click on the eye to view, what you see is that we now have the two tables joined together. So basically this half down here, this is our original gene promoter table, chromosome, start, stop. You notice each of these are 2KB intervals, because we only reported out the 2KB flanks. They're all positive strand because that was one of our filters we applied earlier. 
There's the gene ID. doesn't mean much because it's not a common gene name. It's just a UCSC gene ID. And then these three columns are the DNA's hypersensitivity sites that we joined on. So this is basically saying this 2KB promoter region of this gene overlaps with a DNA's hypersensitivity site with this coordinate chromosome start stop. And every entry here, because we said only return records where there is a join, it hasn't returned any of the genes that don't have, don't overlap a hypersensitivity site. It's only told us here's the set of promoters that do contain at least one DNA's hypersensitivity site. You'll notice some have multiple ones. If you look here, these are all the same number. So this is one gene promoter region that in this case has one, two, three, four, five, six different DNA's hypersensitivity sites within it. It's probably a little small for you guys to read. But Does that make sense? So that's kind of sort of one of the simplest operations, I'd say, you can do with Galaxy. You know, we took some genes. We did some filtering on here. Often I'll end up myself doing that on my own computer because I just find it simpler. I'll often go to UCSC Genome Browser, download, say, a set of genes, open it up in Excel, and you can just sort and filter and look at things yourself, often easier than you can do here. You might want to change around the order of columns uh, to do it in Galaxy, maybe five operations in Excel. You can just do it really fast, upload it as your own custom track. And let's say now we wanted to do some additional manipulation on this <laughs> output file. So this is the DNA <coughs> type sensitivity sites that occur in the promoter regions of genes on the X. We can do some further manipulation on that and say, we're OK, we're only going to now pull out the first X number of lines, because maybe that's what we're interested in. So again, let's just say, I want to select only the first 10 rows of data set number 6, which is this. You hit go, and it will output a new thing that is your first, oh sorry, in this case, 100 regions. So what I'll do now is show you some other examples of some of the tools that are in Galaxy. We're going to, just to play around with some stuff, I'll just show you, we're going to import, we're going to import all the genes in the genome from the UCSC Genome Browser. Hopefully this won't take too long. So I'm doing this in the Genomic Hyper Browser, so it's working on it straight away, which is nice. So one of my other favorite set of commands is in this Join, Subtract, and Group menu over here on the left. I would say that one combined with the operate on genomic intervals enables you to do 1,001 different things on any set of genomic data, whether it be you know, genes, intervals, what have you. One thing to note is in the operate on genomic intervals, there is a join command here that we already used. And what that did is it joined two data sets if they shared a common coordinate in the genome. So in other words, if in the example we did, if a gene promoter region overlapped physically the same coordinate as a DNA's hypersensitivity site, it joined those. So it joined them based on sharing the same coordinate in the genome. There is another really useful join function that is in the join, subtract, and group. Uh, sorry, that's called join two data sets side by side on a specified field. So what that will do is it will join two files, not based on if they share a common coordinate, but if they have a common field. So for example, say you have a data set of, you know, I just here downloaded all the genes in, in the genome. You know, I have a gene ID here. And let's say I'd run a microarray data set myself where I now had gene expression values for a ton of genes in, you know, some samples I was interested in. They also were annotated with the same UCSC gene ID, but nothing else. There was no coordinates attached to them or anything else. I could upload my own array, gene expression array data as a second file, and then I could join them together. I'd say join my gene expression data with this coordinates, annotations of UCSC genes based on this common column. So I would say join two data sets. I want to use data set number two, which is the coordinates of all genes based on column four, which I just remembered was the gene ID column, column one, two, three, four. And then the other file I want to join would be my gene expression data and say, you know, the gene ID was column six. I'd say join that with, you know, column six and keep, you know, keep every line even if it doesn't join with the other table. And then what it will do is spit out for me. Now I'll have every single gene with my expression data that I got that's annotated with chromosome start, stop, anything else I may want. So that join is 
incredibly useful. Like I say, if you wanted, you could upload a list of your friend's telephone numbers to Galaxy, and then if you have another file that's their telephone numbers with their address, Galaxy will join it for you. It doesn't even have to be genomic coordinates. You can basically upload anything. So once you kind of get a little imaginative, you can do lots of things. Another really neat command is this group column. So this is actually really powerful. When you start combining this with the joins, either coordinate join or common field join, group enables you to do a whole ton of stuff. So let's just look back here at the file of UCSC genes we uploaded. What we'll notice is that, for example, there is a whole bunch of entries here that all have the same end site. So I'm presuming this is probably one, I can't tell here. I'm presuming this is one single gene that has multiple different transcription start sites, but this, or the same, no, it must be the same transcription start site because it's a negative strand gene. So this is actually the TSS. And each one of these is a different isoform that has a different combination of introns and exons, some of which end at a different coordinate. So let's say I wanted to ask the question, OK, I have all these genes that I think are the same. How many genes are there that start at the same position on the chromosome? I could say, all right, let's go to the group command. I'm going to operate on this table. It's the only one I've joined, or only one I've uploaded. If I was to say, first filter this file and only keep genes on, say, the positive strand, I would. this would be my transcription start site for those genes. So I could say group on number two. So that's going to look for every entry in that table I had that has the same number or the same string of text at, at column two, and output me the count of how many things there were with that same start coordinate. And I just hit execute. And what it's going to go do now is go through that table, and it's going to say, OK, there were three entries with that start coordinate, one entry with that start co coordinate, one with that, one with that, three with that, four with that. And so it will basically output me a count for every single gene in the genome of how many isoforms of that gene had the same transcription start site. So it's done it for me, and there we go. It said with this start coordinate, there were four entries. This is a very crude operation um, that I've done. It would be much more sophisticated if I grouped by, say, gene name or something. Um, but it's a really powerful command that will just give you summary statistics for massive data sets very quickly. So I don't know if this is going to be feasible for people to have an attempt at, but I drew up this set of kind of problems. And it might work best if people want to try and get together in groups of maybe like two to four people or something, maybe like a row per group. And I would say if different groups want to pick a different one of these challenges, I basically gave you some different, the biological question or the answer that we want to get to. and a hint of what data we may want to use and some different commands that we may want to get to achieve that. I think with some help from myself and Felix and Mafalda, we can come around and try and help you guys figure out how you might go about getting to an answer to some of these questions. So all this can be done. Some of it can be done in the UCSC Genome Browser. Some of it can be done in the Galaxy Toolkit using some of those simple commands I showed you. Many of them will have multiple ways of getting to the same endpoint. Often you'll find in bioinformatics there's not simply a solution. There's three or four different ways of getting to the same endpoint. Some will be more efficient or more elegant than others. Some will be more brute force, but will still get you to the same place at the end of the day. So yeah, if people want to form themselves into little groups, if you think that's going to be helpful, or, or just try it on your own if you want, and we can kind of circulate and try and come around and help you guys solve some of these problems and think about how you might do them. I would say a good place to start is think about what your data that you're inputting is. Look at the format of that data and think, OK, if this is the answer I want to get to, what operations may I need to do on that data to get that answer out the end? So for example, here I'm asking you produce a count of how many genes in the genome have a single isoform, how many genes in the genome have two different splice forms, how many genes in the genome have three different splice forms. Where might you even get that bit of data from? Where is it? I already kind of gave you a pretty big hint doing something like this in a very crude way. But so I don't know if that's way too scary for everyone. But. All right, so I'll, I'll just go through number four, and then um, a couple of people over there are going to explain how we solve number two. All right, so number four is basically saying we want to look at tan repeats located within coding regions of the genes and produce an output that looks something like this. 
So we want a frequency histogram, or let's just say count, where we have tan and repeats split by motif size. So mononucleotide repeats, dinucleotide, trinucleotide up to 100. And so basically you want to produce a graph that says with encoding regions there are this many of each different size of repeat based on their motif size. Okay, you may be thinking, why do we care about that? And I'll show you, it's, it's vaguely interesting. Okay, so our input is basically going to be we need to download the tandem repeat under track. So that's all the simple repeats in the, in the human genome, tandem repeats. So we start, I'm actually working in the hyper browser because it's nice and responsive. We go to UCSC table browser. We're going to do this in HG19. We go to the repeats track. And we take simple repeats. I've worked a lot with the UCSC Genome Browser, so I remember where all of these different um, tracks are. If you haven't, sometimes you have to dig into the browser and go, where was that track? What section was it? Because you can't find it. And we want it for the whole genome. And then you just click, actually, sorry, no, we don't just click that. The default would be bed format. And what that would tell us would be just chromosome start and stop. Now, that's not enough for us, because in our output, later on, we're going to want to separate tan repeats based on the number of bases in their motif. Is it a mononucleotide, a dinucleotide, a trinucleotide repeat? So we need that information. If we don't have it with us, we can't do what we want to do. So the best way would be to say, all right, I, I want only selected fields from this table. We choose that there, hit get output, and it takes us to a page before it does the download saying, okay, you said you only want to download the fields you're interested in, which ones are those? We obviously need chromosome start and end, because that's telling <coughs> us the coordinates of where these repeats are. And then the other thing that we're going to want to finally report is the, what's called the period, the length of the repeat unit. So in other words, is it a mononucleotide, dinucleotide, trinucleotide? We just hit done and send query to Galaxy. I already did that. That was this one here. So this is what we got, the chromosome, the start, <coughs> the end, and that's saying that's a 6-ma motif, that's a 29-ma, that's a 61-ma, that's a dinucleotide, a tetranucleotide. Okay, so we have our first table. The other part of the question was overlapping coding regions of RefSeq genes. So there's, I can think of at least three ways of getting that straight away. We could do it within the UCSC genome browser and just say only output to me the coding regions. We could download all of RefSeq, put it into Galaxy, and there's a tool within Galaxy that is here, GeneBed to exon intron conversion. So what that does is if you input a list of all your genes and say, only tell me the coding exons, it's going to output for you only the exons of those genes. So that would do that for us. I actually did a, a different way, which was within the UCSC Genome Browser itself. So we just went to the Genome Browser, said, OK, we need to be HG19, because that's what we downloaded our repeats in. We want genes. We're going to download RefSeq genes for the whole genome. And so this bed format is OK. We say get output. And it says, what do you want? And we don't want a whole gene. We just want coding exons. And we hit send. And that's going to output for us what I already downloaded here. So here is each one of these lines will correspond to one exon of each gene. So you'll see, for example, that all these ones have the same uh, RefSeq ID. This NN is a RefSeq ID, so it's all identical. So each one of these lines is telling you here is an exon of this gene. So this is a, I don't know what, 15 exon gene here. You know, here is where the next gene starts, because the RefSeq gene ID has changed. OK, so we've got our two basic input tables. We've got one, which is a bit of the genome. This is a really crappy drawing of a gene. 
Um, so we've basically downloaded all these, the exons of the genes. We've thrown out the introns. So that's data set one. Data set two, the first one we downloaded was the location of tandem repeats. So that's going to have some repeats like here. Some others in an intron. Let's say this one has a tandem repeat in it, or maybe even two. And then the question we're asking is, We want to count the number of tan repeats of each motif size that overlap the coding regions of the genes. So the first thing we need to do is filter our set of all tan repeats we downloaded and output only the tan repeats that overlap the coding regions. So that will basically be this one, this one, this one, this one. Let's say there's another one here. So that one will go away, that one will go away. And the way we'll do that is by basically joining those two together and saying, only tell me the tandem repeats that overlap the exons. Yeah? So in Galaxy, that's pretty easy. It's the operate on genomic intervals. I said this is one of my two favorite command groups. And we want to use a join. Well, actually, we could do either. There's multiple ways. So Intersect, you would think, would do that. It's saying which tan repeats intersect which exons. The one thing I'm not quite sure is if that will, I think it may just output a bed format file, which may delete off the really important piece of information we need to retain, which is the motif size. I actually always prefer join, because it does exactly what intersect does, but keeps all of your information. You never lose anything. So we're going to use the join command, and we're going to join simple repeats, which is data set four. With RefSeq genes, data set five, we're going to say one base pair of overlap, that's fine. Even if there's one base pair, it's overlapping the exon. And in this case, it doesn't really matter. We could say only return the records that are joined. That would be only return the tan repeats that overlap the exon. So that's what we want. So we hit go there. So to say the output we're going to have should now be just these tandem repeats that do overlap the exons. Yeah? So that will have solved this, tandem repeats that overlap the ref seek exons. But the critical thing is we need to, we want to do the count the number of each motif size. So we're going to need to do some operation now that respects whether each tan and repeat we got is a one base pair repeat, a two base pair repeat, a three base pair repeat, and we're going to want to count the number of occurrences of mononucleotides, dinucleotides, trinucleotides, etc. Okay, so this is chugging away right now. It's yellow. So that means it's on the servers and it's processing that operation we asked it to do. Hopefully, this won't take too long because it's about a million tandem repeats intersected with quite a few exons, which could take a few minutes. But the command that we're going to want to use is in my other favorite set of commands up here and this group command, which is really powerful, because the data we have is looks like this. Basically, this is the tan and repeat file, chromosome start, stop, and the period, i.e. the motif size of that repeat. So we're going to count how many times, you know, six of tan and repeats occur. We basically want to group on that and say how many different entries, because <coughs> each line is a single tan and repeat, that was how many different entries are there that share that number. So we'll group, in this case, by column four, and just count how many there are. So in the group command, once this is done, oh, it might actually allow me to do it. We will, no, it won't allow me to do it yet. This needs to finish before it will let me. Yeah? So yeah, so that's, a, that's telling you some information about the nature of the tan repeat. So if the period is six, that means it's a six base pair motif. 
So say CAA GGG could be, whatever. And you said the copy number was 10. That means that six base pair motif is repeated 10 times. Correct. That information is just specific to that one repeated region in that place in the genome. All right, so now it's done. Let's just have a look. It's good to always get a sense of what happened. So we started off with nearly a million tandem repeats. We intersected it with about half a million exons. <coughs> and we came out with 13,000 tandem repeats that overlap exons. So instantly we know that, you know, 99% of tandem repeats aren't encoding regions of the genome. That's not unexpected, you know, because a lot of the time these are unstable elements that are expanding, contracting. If that's going on with a gene, that's often not going to be a good thing. So that's not crazy. We can just look at it and see, and here's some of those tandem repeats right now. The weird thing is, yeah, and this, the period is this one. They get offset when you're looking at it. It's sometimes much easier to take it in Excel. So if we wanted to do that, I could just hit Save, Open Folder. There's my Galaxy that I just downloaded. Drag and drop it in Excel. So this is the join. That's the tan and repeats we input. This is the other. The exons of the genes that are joined onto each tan and repeat. So we now know this tan and repeat joins with this exon of this gene. We don't care about all of this stuff over here. All we wanted to know is tell me the tan and repeats that overlap the exons. What we want to do now is count, OK, for each of these different periods, how often does each one occur? So as I said, that's this group command. The key thing before we start the group command is to know which column are we going to be grouping on. So it's column 1, 2, 3, 4. So C4 is our column that we're going to group via. So we hit group. We're analyzing data set 6. That was our join. We want to group by column 4. And the operation that we're asking is just a simple count. So we want count. You can see you can do tons of different things. It's a really good command for generating statistics on a data set. Um, I use this one all the time. And it really doesn't matter what column we count on. We just want to count number of entries. So we could count on column 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It doesn't make any difference. And then we just hit execute. And that's going to go through these 13,000 entries and count the number of occurrences of each one. It's already done. Here's our output. So it's saying there are 10 entries of monomers, 8 entries of tenmers. So what I'm going to do, we could sort this in uh, Galaxy itself, like filter and sort, but we want to make a plot of it so it's easy just to grab it straight out of Galaxy. So we just hit the save, save that, open my folder, there it is. Dump in an Excel. And what we're going to do now, if I just, this is our motif size. That was our count. We're just going to sort that by motif size, small to large. And now we have counts of these and make a plot. Done. So that took like, what, three minutes, maybe? So you may go, why did we bother doing that? And is it interesting? Let's just move that to a new sheet so it's easy to view. And I said, let's do that up to 100. Oh, sorry. Let's just make a new plot. Not plot the whole thing, because it gets crazy. Oh, sorry, that was dumb. All right, it's taken me longer to make the chart in Excel than it is to actually do the analysis of like a million tandem repeats. I just wanted this. Okay, so let me put that in a sheet so it's easy to view. Okay, so this was the output. Can anyone spot any trends? And if we go back, what we did, just to refresh your memory, is we took tandem repeats. And we said, tell me the ones that overlap coding regions of RefSeq genes. 
So we already knew just by looking at the numbers that intersect that you know, 99% of Tanner repeats didn't overlap coding regions. Okay, so that's a really strong bias. Um, can anyone see any patterns in this that they think are important? So the y-axis is frequency. So the big bars are the really common repeats and the low ones are the really uncommon. Is there anything that jumps out at you? This one. Okay, so yeah, that's one weird thing. It's like, okay, everything tails off. You see Tanner repeats with really big motifs. We can see, a, you know, the, the nice thing would have been to make the same distribution of the whole genome, maybe, to give us a comparison, a background count, and compare it to things in coding regions. But yeah, there's obviously some weird outlier going on here. So, like, that's unusual. Um, we'll look at that in a minute. Anything else that you spot? at the other side of the plot. Yeah, there's something going on here, but there's something else that it's more, you've got zero, zero, a lot, zero, zero, quite a few, zero, zero, quite a few. Yeah, so exons are comprised of three base pair, you know, sequences, which are codons, which are in the amino acid. And it makes sense when you think about it, because in coding regions, if you have a mono or a di or a tetra or a penta nucleotide repeat, if that gains or loses a, a copy number, now you've caused a frame shift in that gene. Whereas if you have a tanner repeat that's 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, that's still compatible with keeping that protein in frame and will add or delete codons, but it won't cause a frame shift and stop codon in the gene. So that kind of makes sense. So the other point was, what's that really weird lump at over here? It's 84 base pairs. So for some reason, there's a ton of 84 base pair tandem repeats in coding regions. We can go back, and we need to go back to Galaxy to go back a step. And we could look at some of what these are. So let's just scan down. We need to find an 84-mer. Yell if you see one. Ah, here we go. So there's an 84 base pair repeat. That's the region. We can grab that, go to the human genome. Uh, we need to be in HG19. Plug that in. Let's see where it is. OK, that's the first one. Just remember the gene name. Uh, let's go back to, let's find another one. Again, yell if you see one. I know there's a lot in there, so oh, there we go. There's another one. I'm doing this the really crude way. A much neater way would be to take RefSeq genes, including the common gene name, stick that in Galaxy, join it based on coordinate, and so therefore join the 84 base pair tan and repeats with RefSeq genes, including the gene name, and then you'd see some really obvious trends. Anyone spot the similarity? Gene name? Yeah, and the last one was zinc finger. And I bet every single one we take will be a zinc finger gene. So zinc finger genes have zinc fingers in, as their name suggests. And a zinc finger is made up of an 84 base pair tandem repeat that encodes for each individual zinc finger. So it's a common feature that zinc fingers, as their name, ZNF 436, there's a lot of them in the genome. And they all have this common 84 mer structure in the piece of the coding region that actually contacts DNA. It's made up of whatever 84 divided by 3 is, uh, 28. 28 amino acids that forms each finger of the contact domain that's contacting DNA. And they're a massively expanded gene family, many of which are transcription factors, things like that. So there we go. Yeah. Yeah, so the overlap, that was one of the options we had. And as with many things, you have options. So 
ba 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 ba. If we go back and we can just repeat that and look at it again. The join was we wanted four with five. So tan repeats, overlapping exons. And you can specify here how many base pairs of overlap. One is the default saying any overlap at all, but in some instances, depending on what it is you're asking, you may say, no, I want 10 base pairs of overlap or 50 or 100 or something before I'm going to consider that reasonably overlapping. But often that's a very amorphous answer. Yeah, so if you said it has to be more overlap, then you're going to start losing some, I presume. Did that make sense? So yeah, so our original starting question of this, like I say, I did that in less than five minutes. And we analyzed a million tandem repeats, half a million exons, and yet within galaxies, like 10 clicks of the mouse. <coughs> Most of the time spent waiting for the genome browser just to churn on it. You can suddenly do a genome-wide analysis of coding tandem repeats and start to draw some meaningful biological conclusions. And if you said, oh, you know, now I'm really interested in zinc fingers and what they're doing, um, well, hey, look, we have our table right here. We could sort this by that, and now we have the coordinates of every 84-mer zinc finger motif in the genome, and then we could say, oh, that's cool. Maybe I want to design a custom assay to target those. So you could say, um, all right, fetch all the sequences of those, input it into here, and suddenly you've got all the sequences of all the zinc finger motifs in the entire human genome in less than 10 minutes. Galaxy is really cool. Once you get to figure out, I'd say there's five or 10 basic functions I use a lot. The two different types of join, the join on genomic intervals, the join based on common ID, group, merge, obviously uploading data. Um, yeah, those are the ones I use most, five different commands. And with a combination of those, <coughs> often putting stuff in Excel, doing some <coughs> custom sorts yourself, remove duplicates, you can do all kinds of interesting bioinformatics. All right, did you want to explain how you solved <laughs> that other one, or would you prefer me to do it? OK. Thank you. You're <laughs> So yeah, so we were just looking at this problem here. So yeah, so we just did this. We did it in HG18, actually. Yeah, HG18. RefSeq, whole genome. Yeah, so the, the helpful part here was the bed format, because UCSC Genome Browser has this nice little function that when you say, I want genes in bed format, you can just say, I only want five prime UTRs. So with one click, rather than downloading the whole gene, we just download the bits that we wanted. But again, there's multiple ways we could have got to that. And for our next step, um, after a failed attempt to try to unzip the file, what happened was we just looked up the, um, yeah, the entity transcription factor. And the first hit is the website where you can actually see it as a custom track, the, all the coordinates of the transcription factors yeah, the problem was I didn't realize this link it takes you to a gzipped file, and these computers don't have software to unpack it, so I apologize for that. But luckily, if you click on this other link, it's there it is as a, a, a custom track. And because it's now a custom track, you can go into Tools, Table Browser, 
select custom track, and there it is for download. Say so send to Galaxy, and it's in Galaxy. So again, there's multiple ways to get to the same endpoint. Oh, it does? OK, there you go. There's another way of solving it. Why did you use the transcription factor? You could. So yeah, the, uh, again, many options. Like if I said, and we were having some of these conversations earlier with uh, Brian, like, OK, if you want to define transcription factor binding sites, how do you want to do that? We could use encode data. That's done by ChipSeq in 138 different cell lines, looking at, I don't even know, how 88 different transcription factors. This particular one I like a lot. Um, the nice thing about this particular data set, if we just send it to Galaxy, I'll show you, is that it defines a specific motif. It's done bioinformatically. It's a really nice paper where they took Jasper as their input, but then filtered it really heavily based on other epigenomic data. And so they're basically defining a set of transcription factors, that, uh, binding sites, the individual motifs, ranging from 4 to 16 mer sequences, um, as opposed to like chip seek data where you usually get a peak of like 100 to 400 base pairs in size where like somewhere in there a transcription factor is binding. One f exactly, so it's asking the question for the one factor that you assay with that antibody, whereas this is, exactly. So when this uploads in a minute, hopefully. Oh, it's put it in a different. OK, so it's there. So if we look at it, oh, this has gone into Galaxy. This is the format of that data set. So again, bed format, chromosome, start, stop. And then it's got either an individual transcription factor with its Jasper um, ID for that consensus motif, or it includes other uh, consensus motifs that are present at high frequency in the genome that are probably other transcription factors we haven't identified. All right. So for the next step, we would need to um, operate on and Sorry, I have to get up. <laughs> it put it into um, a different Galaxy instance than I'd uploaded the genes. Uh, yeah. So we're actually going to do the transcription. So again, you have choices. You could say join transcription factors with UTRs, or you could say join UTRs with transcription factors. It will give you the same thing at the end of the day, but you have to be aware which way around it is, because you have this choice here of saying return the first data set, the second data set. So you want to, we want to report the transcription factor binding sites. So if that's what we're choosing as our first, then we want um, well, we wouldn't want to choose the second data set, otherwise that's not, not what it would be telling us, but this one's fine. In the end, we choose inner join, which is just the union of the two data sets, so we have to look at that. And while we're running that, the next two steps will be, so in the um, transcription vector uh, data set, they have a you know, chromosome, the coordinates, and they also have a feature column. I could, like the, where the transcription factor is described or the binding motif is described. 
And what we can do is actually group, uh, I think it was yeah, yeah. in another tool set, but yeah, we can just use that as a grouping factor. So we can group each particular um, transcription factor, um, basically each transcription factor, and just count how many instances of that have, have occurred. And then after that, after we get that data set out, it's as simple as sorting it in uh, descending order just to find out the top 10 transcription factors. So that <coughs> present, so there's a, I think another tool Still set. Still waiting here. Yeah, like, what is it, join? There's another tool set where you can, not join. Um, Group? Yeah. yeah, so the one we used before again, this, oh, okay, so it's done. So we now have, this is our data set of transcription factors that are located within five prime UTRs. So here's the information on the transcription factor, oh, sorry, up to here. And over here on the right, we have, this is the five prime UTR with the gene ID. And exactly as you said, we just want to count column four now. So how many times did that occur? How many times did that occur in the data set? But as you notice, because we didn't take into account the fact that some genes have multiple five prime, uh, multiple isoforms, so one gene's five prime UTR may be represented in the data set multiple times, you'll notice that one transcription factor is listed more than once. So. You go up to group. You have to remember it's C4. So we're taking data set number four. We're going to group by column four. We can ignore case. And the operation we want to do is, again, simply count. And it doesn't matter what we're counting, just count number of instances. So yeah, the longest part usually is just waiting for the servers to respond. If you didn't have to do that, you could probably do it in less than a minute. And if you want to speed it up, you can also just sort it on Excel after this part is done. So. And um, just a quick note for the, if you wanted to remove duplicate isoforms for a gene, you could just um, basically, out, what was it? You would output the, I kind of forgot actually, you would output the RefSeq file. Yeah, you could download the RefSeq file, including the common gene name, and then remove duplicates in Excel. There you're presented with a choice because a lot of genes will have more than one isoform, and the choice is which isoform do you keep? Um, do you keep all of them? Do you keep the first one? Do you keep the last one? Like, It's a bioinformatic decision that you have to make. Um, you often get presented with those decisions when doing things like this. There is no right or wrong answer. It's just usually just thinking about what effect may it have on your data if you choose one way versus the other and just being aware of that. At least so you know that hopefully you can choose the one that will have the least inherent bias on your outcome. Um, so yeah, so this is all the accounts of different transcription factor binding sites. So I just save them, dump them straight into Excel. We'll sort based on count largest to smallest, and there we go. TTK, MAS, HEB, there are three most common transcription factor binding sites in 5 prime UTRs. Some anonymous motifs, NIF. So you can imagine if this was your real data, now you've maybe identified you know, what you think are the most significant transcription factors. It's really easy to do like an enrichment analysis. If you have a set of genes that are maybe overexpressed in your system, you could calculate the fraction of occurrences of different transcription factors in those versus background, and then do a fold enrichment and a t-test or something, or a chi-squared test, and get a significant difference of which transcription factors are enriched in your set of differentially expressed genes, for example. Doesn't take long. All right. What's people's thoughts? Do you want to go home and rest? Do you want to solve another problem? <laughs> and you can be honest. <laughs> so, uh, so it's so weird because you look, you look at like the transcription factor binding and that stuff, and you can 
compare like the, the Pritchett Lab stuff versus the actual version of Chipsy from the code versus the conservative factor binding sites. They all have very different results. Yes, yeah, so the conserve sites, I wouldn't attach a lot of weight to those because it's basically just looking at where is there a motif, a consensus motif from Jasper and saying, calling that as your transcription factor binding site, which is not based on any little bit of biology, but not much biology. It's just saying, is there a six base pairs of something that I see in the genome? Um, yeah? Yeah. So let me, let me rephrase the question. The Pritchard Lab has a lot less binding sites than the chip seek data. Yeah, so there's a... Are all these other, all, and so especially, so in fact, on some things, there's a, a chip seek signal that's incredibly strong that's not found at all in the Pritchard data. So, yeah, so the, the so, centipede data um, set's based on lymphoblastoid cell lines. That's one cell type. Right, no, so, but the, so, you know, what you were saying is that, well, if, if you're thinking about it in cell lines through the context, then you, may, then you may have it the other way around, right? You're not going to be able to pull down a region because of regulation. In this situation, you actually are able to pull down regions and, ones that, and have very strong peaks in certain regions that are not predicted by the Pritchard algorithm. The question is, like, how do you navigate that? I mean, that's, you know, it's... You have to try and make an informed decision on what you think is the most robust data set. Um, and it's going to depend also what downstream applications you're doing. So obviously the chip seek data, I would say, in theory, should be the most reliable, presuming it's done in the cell type that is what you're interested in, and it's the transcription factors you care about, because each chip seek assay is assaying a transcription factor in a cell type. Um, so it might not be the right cell type you want. Um, the advantage of the, the centipede algorithm is it gives you the specific motif, so it's very precise, um, whereas the ChIP-seq data is a region of a few hundred base pairs, so the precision is low. So if, for example, you were looking at, OK, I want to try and identify non-coding mutations that I think may be affecting functionally relevant sites in the genome from, say, whole genome sequence data, and I'm going to do that by overlapping it with what I think are important transcription factors. Um, you're probably going to have a lot more precision by using a six or eight base pair motif as opposed to a 600 base pair chip seek peak, of which maybe only five or 10 base pairs is actually physiologically relevant. So in other words, 95 plus percent of that peak is going to be noise. But yeah. Again, it's always decisions. What do you think is going to be the most appropriate data for you? How much do you trust it? Is it? So what was the thing if you, if you were to take the Jasper database and then basically, basically using your Galaxy or your genome browser or whatever, then cross-reference it with your ChIP-seq data, you may be able to start to get a hint of what transcription factor binding things. Yeah, so that's a reasonable data. approach, you're, yeah. You're cutting it down from like a whole genome. To yeah, like yeah. Yeah, or more broadly, you could overlap it with DNA's hypersensitivity sites, or maybe, because that's non-specific. because then you're not requiring that, you know, then you're saying any transcription factor, you could take all of Jasper, which is any transcription factor binding, all DNA's hypersensitivity sites, which is saying anywhere in the genome where a protein is contacting DNA, and, and say, I'll take the ones common to both. That, that's not an unreasonable thing to do. I mean, there's still going to be some noise in there, but yeah, you'll probably cut down the noise a lot. All right, what's the verdict? People want to finish, or do they want to solve one more? Solve one more? All right. Um, all right, so we've done two and four. What about this one? Number of splice variants or plot of lines per chromosome, line density? That splice variants, this one? Okay, that one's pretty easy. 
Um, so let's go back to Genomic Hyper Browser. So we need to start by basically getting the list of RefSeq genes. So we go to UCSC Table Browser. We're going to work in HG19. We're going to have RefSeq genes for the whole genome. And the one thing we want to do here is we want some tag that will enable us to say what is a differing splice variant of the same gene. The easiest way to do that, I would say, is by having the common gene name attached to your data. I don't know why whenever you download it, that's not a part of the data you download. For me, that's like a really obvious thing I want to know, like what's the name of this gene? Aside from its chromosome and coordinate, that's probably the next most important thing for me. But for whatever reason, it's not included in the standard bed file. So you have to say, I want to pick select specific fields from that table to include in my download. So you say selected fields. It's now going to bring up, OK, which fields do you want from that table? We're going to want the name. That's going to be the RefSeq ID, like an MN, uh, NM ID, and then the string of numbers, which is not very meaningful. We'll keep it, though. I'm saying we'll keep it. We keep it. Yes, we'll keep it. We'll have chromosome, strand, transcription start, transcription end. And the key one is going to be this name 2, which is actually the common G name, like CFTR or P53 or whatever, <coughs> things that make sense to most of us. That's good. Send it to Galaxy. So it appears up here. Hopefully, this will be fast, because I'm doing this in the Hyper Browser again. So yeah, it's already loading. So let's go back to the problem. So the question is, we want to know the number of splice variants per gene. And we want to produce a count that says, how many genes just have one isoform? How many genes have two isoforms? So our final, let's go over here. Our final thing will be count. And then it's going to be, we're basically going to want a bar plot that looks something like this. How many genes have? you know, different numbers of isoforms. So there's our table. It's always good to look at it. OK, we have 60,000 different entries in RefSeq. There's definitely not that many genes in the genome. So that's telling us a lot of these are redundant. And you can see that in the name. So for example, here's all the isoforms of ASIN2. You can see there's multiple start and end points for those isoforms. They all have a different NMID, but they share a common gene name. So that now gives us a handle where we can reduce this set down to how many isoforms are there of ASIN2. It's easy to count. We can say there's seven. But we don't want to do that for 60,000 different entries. So the easy way to do that, again, is group. This is going to be our common link that links all the isoforms of one gene together. It's column 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, where did we go? Totally lost it. Here we go, group. So we're going to input our genes that we just downloaded. We're going to group by column six. And again, we're just going to do a count. Doesn't matter which column we count on. It's just counting number of entries that share that gene name. Chugging away, it's done. <coughs> we got 27,000 different unique gene IDs. Here they are. And now we have for this gene, it has one isoform, this gene, six isoforms. So if we want to make it, oh, well, no, we're not quite done. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So now we have for each gene the number of isoforms it has. And we want to further reduce this to now group by the number of isoforms. So we want to say, OK, that gene has one, that gene has one, that gene has one, that gene has one. How many genes are that have one isoform? So we can now do another group. This time, we'll be putting this table as our input and grouping on column two and counting the number of unique gene IDs. So we do group based on column two. We do another count operation. Or we could say count distinct, count number of unique gene IDs. They should already be unique. So this might be redundant of column one. So in other words, I can say count the number of distinct gene names I see in column one. There we go. If 
we wanted, we could get some other statistics. So we could say, yeah, let's do that group on column two. And we'll also calculate the mean. We'll calculate the minimum. And we'll also calculate the maximum. Just for fun, because you can do multiple operations in the same group. And so now we'll save that, open it up, dump it in Excel. Whoa, okay, something weird went on here. Like I say, sometimes odd things happen. I think it's just because there's so many gene names that they've spilled over it into, into that column somehow. But we should be able to figure it out if we do sort on no headers, sort on column A. I think that's going to get us close. So yeah, here's a number of things. Oh, hang on. OK, I did something totally wrong. I apologize. I've got lost. <coughs> yeah, OK, I did something totally wrong there. This is actually <laughs> the one we want. So this is. Yeah, the second one I did where, let's look this up. Um, yeah, so we calculated mean, minimum, maximum. OK, I've got myself lost. I'm going to start again. <laughs> this is what happened. Yeah, I screwed up somewhere. I, I, yeah, I think I might have done. Hang on. Oh, did I choose the wrong thing? Something definitely unintentional happened there. OK, so I want to take 10 and, all right. Yeah. All right. Just goes to show you it's easy to get mixed up. So there we go. So count, and that should be the right thing. Group one, column two, which is that one. All right, let's try this again. So yeah, you'll often find when you do things, you make screw ups like this, and you end up with really confusing histories. And All right, let's have a look. That looks better. So let's save that. Dump that back in here. <coughs> sort that by column A. <coughs> and then this should be the number of genes with, so we could make, a, well, we could make a plot like that. There's that plot there. Oops. Or we can make a scatter plot, whatever you want. Similar kind of thing. So there you go. But again, usually the longest part's just waiting for the servers to churn. Once you actually kind of know what you're doing and don't screw it up like I did, then it's literally like two or three minutes work. So should we do the last one just for fun? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so this one was make a bar plot of the fraction of lines on each human chromosome. So let me just get rid of some of these. So we start off, get data. We want to go from the table browser again. This time we're going to be downloading repeat masker track. So repeat masker is an algorithm that's uh, used to define signs, lines, alus, all the common repeats in the genome. 
we want to download for the whole genome. I could, yeah, there's different ways we could do it. That's a good idea. We need to make sure this is where you get lost in the table format. I don't remember if it's repeat name or class or family, where they define. It's class. Thank you. And it's line or line one? OK, so you tried solving this one. All right, did you, you you've done this already? Do you want to explain what you did, or do you want me to do it? Oh, OK, you're cheating. <laughs> OK, so again, there's multiple ways you could do this. A neat way, yeah, is to say only report out the line elements. Another way would be get it, and you could use group. If you first concatenated chromosome column and repeat class column together, you would have a single column that now said, like, chromosome 12 line, chromosome 14 line. That would then give you a neat column that you could group on to count the number of base pairs or whatever of the line elements per chromosome. So there's all kind of cheats that you can do that it's not real data. You know, chromosome 12 line is just your reference point to say that's a line on chromosome 12, but it gives you a handle to sort the data on. So I think this will work. Genome, send it to Galaxy. So our problem was, so the other thing we need is the length of each human chromosome. So if we want to calculate the fraction of, so this is something I found just by Googling. In the older versions of the UCSC genome browser, it was right there on the home page. It would have a table showing you the sequence length, the uh, gaps and everything, but you can find it by some easy Google searches. OK, oh, there we go. So let's just check what we got. OK, yeah, so now we have chromosome start, stop, the type of element. So that's different subtypes of line. So L1P is primate specific, There's some human specific ones. OK, so that looks OK. What we now need to do here, well, we'll take that in a second. So the question was, what's the fraction of line repeat? So the first thing we want to do is uh, sum together all the, the lines per chromosome. So we've already got lines only, and now we want to group by chromosome. So we go back up to join, subtract, and group. We're going to be taking track 14 as our input, grouping by column 1. That's the chromosome annotation. And ah, actually, we need to do something else first. What we have. We have chromosome start and stop, but we need length. I guess that's, yes, that is, OK, we do already have length. I was going to say, I thought we needed to calculate that. It would be very easy to calculate. You just do stop minus start, and that would give you length of each element. So we could have just done an extra you know, text manipulation to add in a new column that was C3 minus C2, which would be the length. But we already have it there. So yeah, we can proceed with our group. And we're going to, whoops, and we want a summing grouping by column 1, which is our chromosome. So we sum together the total length of all lines per chromosome. And this, so we group by column 1 and sum on column 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So group C1, sum C5. Make sense? Anyone shout if you're not following? So grouping by C1, we're going to sum on C5. Rounding is fine. It's all in base pairs anyway. Hit go. So while that's chugging away, let's grab these. So this is the lengths of each chromosome. Let's just do a quick and dirty. Paste that. Let's see if this works. Yeah, uh, no. OK, that's not too bad. Let's delete those. OK, so we've got the chromosomes and the lengths. Let's see what Galaxy is doing. It's done. Let's see what the output was. OK, so ooh, we've got some really big numbers. 
we may run into a problem here, I'm not sure. Because it's rounded, uh, it should be okay. It's rounded them to like five decimal places. But you can see, like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot more than just the regular chromosomes. There's all these other fragments, you know, random bits, different haplotypes in here, chromosome unknowns. So there's a whole lot of other junk beside those chromosomes, but we can sort that out pretty easily. So we're just 89 different chromosomes it's mapped to. Shove that in Excel again. Let's sort that by column A. And then we can just delete out the trash that we don't want. This might take a while. Did you do this in a more elegant way than I'm doing it here? Yeah. Let's try changing that. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, OK. It would be easier in a text editor. I was going to try and get fancy, and wherever there's an underscore, that's telling me there's something that's not a regular chromosome. Force that into a new column. But it's barely needed. I'm there anyway. OK, so there's the chromosomes. That's the size. Oh, OK, it does have it. It's just showing it as a E. OK, so this is our length. Let's just, so that's, that's the amount of line. That's the chromosome. We had this over here. So if I just remove CHR, place all with nothing, we can sort that to get it into order. Oops. I do have headers. OK, so now I put it in order. And it should line up with what I just downloaded here. So we'll grab that. So yeah, we have everything's in the same order. So now we have number of base pairs of line element per chromosome total length of that chromosome. So if we just want to calculate fraction, we could throw it back in Galaxy, but why bother? Excel's good at some things. Um, that divided by that. And that should be, I think, the fraction of repeat per chromosome. So there you go. So yeah, so the weird outlier here is something's going weird there. I thought that should have been the highest. I thought that X was most strongly enriched for lines. Did I do it the wrong way around? Maybe I just did it the wrong way around. You're right, I did. So again, it's always good to have an expectation of what you hope for at the end. <laughs> So yes, the X, now that I've done it the right way around, is the most strongly enriched human chromosome for line elements, which some people think may have something to do with X chromosome inactivation. And yes, on an average, it's is that 10%, roughly, per chromosome is 8% is line element. So again, in the space of five or 10 minutes, you've just done a genome-wide analysis of all repeats, and you could come up with some biological hypothesis based on that. All right, was that useful? 
So the best thing I would say, like Galaxy is one of those things in the UCC Gene Browser, like you, you learn it best just by trying, just messing around with it, trying things. You can do incredibly complicated analysis. Like I say, I've done whole things with transcription factor binding site enrichments of giant data sets. And um, you can sometimes get lost in the redundancies that you get when you're joining gene lists and things because many genes, as you've seen, have many isoforms listed that can cause problems. But the more you use it, the more you figure out what the basic tools are and how to string them together, you can start doing lots of really cool things. Particularly, I find just taking things and throwing it back into Excel, sorting it, filtering it, throwing it back into Galaxy, rerunning your intersections, your groupings, um, is pretty powerful. Or learn R, and you can do it too. But anything anyone wants to ask? Yeah. There is a plotting function. I'm not very familiar with it. Um, so yeah, graph display data. Yeah, so it will do histograms and maybe with some of those things I threw into Excel, I think it will do for you too. Yeah, I've never actually played with that. Uh, there's a ton of, I mean, there's so many things in Galaxy. So just like I, I explained the track hubs in UCSC Genome Browser, so it shows you the sort of public list that's right there on the home page, but there's all these other hidden tracks that people have contributed, but they don't show up unless you say, I want to see this stuff. The same is true in Galaxy. So there's all people make all kinds of tools, and they will kind of make them available. So each one of these things here on the left is you know, some tool. It's, there's some underlying you know, R scripts or something that are running in the background. Whenever you hit go over here on the right, that it starts to execute. So there's a lot of other tools that are available on Galaxy, but aren't immediately shown to you in all these things on the left. I'm trying to remember the way is in workflows. No. I think there's a I don't remember how to get to it. There's like a toolbox somewhere where you can basically access all the kinds of things that other people have done. And there's a gazillion and one different pipelines that people have set up to do stuff. Obviously the negative part of that is sometimes it's not 100% clear of what their pipeline is doing, but there's a lot more things in there than you just see on, on the left. And a lot of these things are, you know, have many different, I mean, this is just one thing we're looking at, you know, there's like maybe 50 different tools in that one header. And a lot of the focus, what they're doing now is all these next generation sequencing tools, so manipulating VCF files, you know, RNA-seq mapping, read mapping, variant calling, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I don't remember how to access it. There is some Maybe it's in the search function or the tools here. If you read in the, the help, the, there's some way of accessing all the other tools that people have made available that aren't shown to you instantly here, but are there hidden in the background. Any other questions? No? Everything's great? But yeah, go away and use it. The more you use it, the better you get. And um, as I say, I have used it for doing things with people's phone numbers and stuff too, or like all kinds of stuff you throw in and like, oh yeah, Galaxy will do that, like join it together. It doesn't care. It's expecting things to be bed format, but sometimes you can fall. I just do make columns that are chromosome one, one, two, and paste down for the whole table. And it's like, yeah, fine, I'll take that. And then you can join on all the other columns afterwards. So. All right. If anyone has any more questions, just let me know. But otherwise, go and enjoy New York City. That's it. You're free. <laughs>